Chapter 131 Judgment Day Countless demons gathered near the black mist, waiting for the moment when the giant gate of the abyss would open. Not only demons but even some monsters were participating, as though they were about to attend a grand festival. Such a large-scale war summons caused a commotion in the entire abyss. Roy was among these demons, but he lowered his head and ordered Fat Tiger beside him in a low voice, Fat Tiger, go back to our lair and take care of the house. Don't follow me this time. Fat Tiger had no doubts about Roy's order at all. His three heads barked at Roy, then he spread his wings and flew back. Roy had his reasons for making Fat Tiger go back. He was very clear that such a large-scale war summons meant that the demons might encounter an extremely strong opponent. By having Fat Tiger stay in the abyss, once Roy encountered any danger, he could use his teleport skill to return to the abyss directly. Don't forget that Roy had made Fat Tiger a teleport destination. If they separated, Roy would have an additional life preservation method. At critical moments, he could teleport back to the abyss without even needing to engrave a magic formation. The huge gate of the abyss opened faster than he imagined. The moment the gate opened, the countless demons gathered rushed into it and then disappeared into the black light. Roy was not in a hurry to rush in. After all, he did not understand the situation on the other side of the gate. Even if he encountered enemies as soon as he teleported over, he could let the demons who entered first fight them. Only when the demons were about done entering did Roy fly into the gate of the abyss. However, after the light of the teleportation disappeared, Roy found that the other side of the gate was not a battlefield like he originally thought but a colossal space that was equally dark and full of lava and flames. This situation stunned Roy for a moment, causing him to think that he was still in the abyss. But then he suddenly realized that this place was probably the abyss outpost mentioned in Arania's inherited memories. The abyss outpost referred to different spaces that demon lords and demon kings had specially opened to facilitate the attack on certain worlds. These other spaces were usually built by avoiding the power of the world's rules, and the interior environment was exactly the same as the abyss, which was why it was full of lava and flames. With this forward outpost, the demon army no longer needed to frequently travel back and forth through the gates of the abyss when attacking a world. After all, no matter how powerful demon lords and demon kings were, opening a gate of the abyss consumed a massive amount of magic power. With such an outpost, not only could they amass a huge army before the war, but when there was no need to fight, the demons could stay in the outpost and remain unaffected by the power of the world, enabling them to remain in this world for a long time. Such an outpost could not be established in every world. It could only appear in some high magic worlds because only in these high magic worlds would the power of the world have a weaker repulsive force toward high level demons. High level demons could stay for a long time and do their best to operate the war. Roy looked around and saw large numbers of demons constantly pouring out from dozens of huge gates of the abyss in this abyss outpost. This scene was rather shocking because the abyss was so vast that you usually could not see so many demons. As Roy flew in the sky and looked at all kinds of demons clustered together. The ground was full of demons that could not fly, and the demons flying in the sky were like migrating birds, circling and turning into a huge current. The sounds of countless demons formed strong waves that spread in all directions. Roy could not tell how many demons had gathered at the outpost at the moment, but it could be said that anyone who saw this demon army would fear it. The war potential of the abyss demons was vividly displayed at this moment. Although there were countless demons gathered at the moment, with a closer look, he could see that all the demons were actually divided clearly. The majority of them were low-rank demons. But at the same time, low-rank demons had no status. After appearing from the gates of the abyss, they all consciously rushed to the front because they knew that they were cannon fodder charging at the front in this kind of war. From Roy's point of view, if he were a low-rank demon in such a war, he would rather find a corner to hide in the abyss than come. But the problem was that low-rank demons would not think like this. After all, there were very few demons with sufficient reason who could control their urges to kill and destroy. Apart from that, they also instinctively had a strong desire for souls all of which prompted them to participate in every battle and fight as much as possible. In the middle, where Roy was, was middle-rank demons. Compared to low-rank demons, there were much fewer middle-rank demons, but it looked like there were still hundreds of thousands. And as the core, middle-rank demons were generally the true main force in combat. Roy saw many middle-rank demons with weapons in their hands, and some of them even wore armor. Behind middle-rank demons were the even fewer high-rank demons, and Roy estimated that there were only a few thousand of them. High-rank demons were the commanders on the battlefield. Finally, it was the demon lords. Roy could only see a few. The fewer the numbers, 
the more powerful they were. Even from afar, Roy could feel the immense pressure coming from the demon lords. Different from Rogerus's incarnation that he saw before, these demon lords appeared in the outpost in their true bodies. Their power and magic power lingered around their bodies, and no demons dared to approach them even though they were just standing there. Roy did not know the names of these demon lords, and it was impossible for him to ask, so he just quietly waited in the formation of middle rank demons. He knew that it was definitely not these demon lords who initiated this large-scale war summons but someone else. As expected, when the demon army at the outpost was almost fully gathered, a stronger force suddenly appeared. When this force appeared, the demons flying in the sky let out a cry and hurriedly landed. They collapsed on the ground and shivered. The same was true for the demons on the ground. The low rank demons had already collapsed, the middle rank demons knelt, the high rank demons could barely stand, and only the demon lords could maintain their postures. However, they hammered their chests in the direction the force came from to express their respect. Roy also felt that his body was extremely heavy at the moment. The immense magic power in the air formed a huge pressure on him, causing him to kneel on the ground like the other middle rank demons. Roy was very clear that a demon king had appeared. An enormous circle of flames suddenly rose in a huge open space, and these flames formed the demon's iconic pentagram upside down. In the raging fire magic formation, the first thing that he saw was the tips of a pair of curved wings that appeared bit by bit. A giant fiery red demon with wings wrapping around his body to form a spindle shape gradually floated up from the magic formation. After his entire body floated up, his gigantic pair of demon wings opened up, revealing his appearance. This giant demon had a pair of incomparably strong reverse wings. The bone spike on the ends of each wing rose into the sky, looking ferocious. His demon horns were also very large. They stretched out from both sides of his head, extended around his temples a bit, and finally stood upright in front of his forehead, looking like a crown. His right shoulder was bare, and Roy could see his fiery red skin and the rune tattoos on his shoulder. His left shoulder was covered by shoulder armor. His demon eyes were golden and full of killing and destruction. His entire face looked as though it was constantly angry, and even when he breathed, his mouth and nostrils would spew out strong flames. Without a doubt, he was an extremely powerful and terrifying demon. Just his appearance alone caused the noisy outpost to become silent. After appearing, he spread his wings, slowly floated into the sky, and then said in a hoarse voice, My name is Samael. An incarnation of the King of Wrath. Warriors of the Abyss, this world's contract seals have been broken and Judgment Day is coming. Here, a decisive battle between angels and demons has arrived. Slaughter. Destruction. Be it humans or angels, kill all the enemies in front of. You. With Samael's declaration of war, the millions of demons present could not help but roar loudly. Demon King Samael extended his claws and waved at the void. A huge fissure tore open in the space of the abyss outpost, revealing the blue sky outside. This was the real world of this war. The massive army of demons howled and rushed toward this fissure. Roy was swept along the demon army through the fissure. After arriving outside, the dazzling sunlight made him uncomfortable, but he did not have time to care about this. The moment he emerged, he found himself in the sky, but strangely, he could step on this ground of white clouds. At the end of the clouds was an enormous city shining with white light. And in the sky above the city were countless white-winged angels waiting. Damn it! It really is a war against angels. While Roy was cursing in his head, he heard the voice of a high-ranked demon yelling from behind. Attack. Destroy the White City. Roy seemed to understand a little. It seemed that the city of angels in front was the outpost of heaven in this world, and the outpost was named the White City. Wait, I seem to have some impression of this name. And the name of Demon King Samael before. Chapter 132 Death Descent the space fisher demon King Samael ripped open directly connected the abyss outpost to the heaven outpost. When the demon army poured out of the void like a flood, the angel army on the other side blew the horn of the war. Amid the sound of the horn, a large number of angel soldiers in golden armor flapped their wings and charged at the demon army. The moment the two sides collided, countless amounts of purple and golden blood splattered. The angels were well-trained and disciplined warriors, and even ordinary angel warriors were stronger than low-ranked demons. They waved their lances and slashed at the demon army, easily tearing the bodies of their opponents. But there were simply too many low-ranked demons as the vanguard. Even though the angels were killing their compatriots, they still pounced on the angels fearlessly. It only took a few low-ranked demons to pounce together to pull an angel soldier down from the air. When the angel soldiers landed, 
the demons would bite them with their mouths full of fangs and saliva, tearing the bodies of the angels, enjoying the pleasure of killing in their screams. At the rear of the angel army, countless golden lightning balls fired. These were the energy bolts that the other angel soldiers shot with their lances. Although these golden lightning balls killed many demons, it did not help at all. Soon, more demons filled the gaps. The moment Roy rushed out of the fissure, he saw the scene of the angel's vanguard being overwhelmed by the demon army. The individual combat strength of an angel might be stronger than that of a demon, but the disparity between their numbers was far too great. The entire front was constantly advancing toward the angel's white city. In the sky, a high-ranked demon opened his demon wings and flew in the air. He laughed sinisterly, waved his axe, and pointed in front of him. Ha ha ha! Just charge in like this and completely destroy that hateful city of light. Many middle-ranked demons beside Roy rushed forward as well. With the appearance of the middle-ranked demons, a lot of magic appeared on the battlefield. Flames appeared in the sky and enveloped the angels like heavy rain. These flames ignited the wings of the angels, burning them into flaming people, and then they fell amid screams. Ons. At the same time, the demons suffered the retaliation of the angels. A large number of golden pillars of light descended from the sky, and the demons within the pillars of light all had their skin and flesh lacerated, making terrible cries before turning into ashes under the holy power. Roy discovered that even the souls of these demons killed by holy power could not escape. In other words, they would not be able to resurrect in the abyss even with the protection of the Ouroboros mark. Similarly, once angels were killed, their souls would immediately be devoured by the demons nearby and could not be retrieved. This was the true meaning of the sworn enemies. Both sides could completely annihilate the souls of the other side. Roy spread his wings and flew in the air. He took advantage of his high-speed flying to carefully avoid the areas with the golden pillars of light. He knew that the most important thing in such a battle was to protect himself. Looking at the current situation, the angels would not be able to stop the demon army for long. If he wanted to enjoy the fruits of victory, he had to persevere in the battle. However, although he did not take the initiative to find an opponent, one took the initiative to find him. An angel soldier wearing golden armor and a full face helmet swung his lance and killed a demon in front of him. He looked up and saw Roy flying past him, so he did not even think about it before he flapped his wings, rushed up, and charged at Roy with a stab. Roy stretched out his hand, and Frostmourne emerged from the void. He held the hilt of his sword and blocked the opponent's sudden stab. November. The angel soldier was charging fiercely just now and could not stop his charge. When he passed by Roy, Roy slashed his arm. Golden blood spurted out, and the angel soldier screamed. He turned back and slashed his lance at Roy. The two struck and blocked each other in the air, and the collisions of their weapons made loud clangs. But with the battle in the background, these sounds did not even cause any ripples. After another collision, Roy mustered all his strength and sent the angel soldier flying. Then he quickly waved Frostmourne and threw out two icebound strikes. The angel soldier reacted quickly and immediately adjusted his body after being sent flying. He shot out golden lightning from his lance to block an icebound strike, but the other one directly hit his wings. The icebound strike did not tear his wings off but instead exploded, instantly freezing his wings. The angel soldier could not flap his wings to maintain his balance and immediately fell headfirst. Roy flapped his wings, swooped down, and pierced Frostmourne into the angel soldier's chest in mid-air. However, the angel soldier was still alive. With blood spewing out from his mouth, he pointed his palm at Roy and shouted, Die, demon! Roy raised his head. The holy light blasted out from the angel soldier's palm grazed his demon horns and flew into the sky. The next second, Roy's tail pierced through the angel soldier's chest from below, ending his life. With the angel soldier's body, Roy fell onto the clouds. He drew out Frostmourne from his opponent, stretched out his hand, and stored the angel soldier's soul. Taking a moment to look, Roy found that he got a low-class holy soul. This meant that the rank of these angel soldiers was not high. In Arania's inherited memories, angels were divided into nine levels according to the number of wings. There were three levels for two winged angels, which were, from low to high, angel, archangel, and principality. Four winged angels also had three levels, which were power, virtue, and dominion. And the three levels of six winged angels were throne, cherub, and seraph. These three spheres and nine orders were the so-called hierarchy of angels, showing that heaven also had a strict hierarchy. When fighting against angels, you usually judge their strength by looking at their number of wings. This angel soldier was at most at the principality level. 
He was very powerful when fighting against low rank demons, but with Roy's current strength, it had been relatively easy to deal with him. However, you had to pay special attention to their attitudes in combat. Some high level angels would put away their extra wings when they were not fighting with all their might because more wings were just symbols of strength, which was not convenient in daily life. It was the same for demons. Some high rank demons and demon lords would grow more wings after promotion. Six wings were not unique to angels, and demons had them as well. However, for the convenience of normal actions, some demons would also choose to retract their wings. After killing this angel soldier, Roy roughly knew the power of angels. He was a top middle rank demon, and the ones he could deal with were probably the second sphere power and virtue angels. But it would be a little difficult for him to deal with a dominion angel because angels were stronger than demons at the same rank. At this moment, the sky was already burning red with the flames of the demons. With the middle rank and high rank demons joining the battle, all kinds of large scale killing spells raged on the battlefield. Under these circumstances, Roy did not rashly use his frost magic because the effect would probably not be very good so he simply flew in the air and specially looked for ordinary angels soldiers with two wings. In fact, in addition to looking at their wings to distinguish between the strength of angels, you could also look at their equipment. Those wearing the same standard armor were definitely low-level angels, and those with more magnificent equipment were naturally stronger angels. In this world where appearance was everything, let alone hell, even heaven was the same. After killing three more angels, Roy found that the demon camp was about to push toward the city gates of the White City. Although the angels did their best to resist, the disparity in numbers was too great, and they could only retreat again and again. E more. Even Roy could tell that Heaven's war preparations seemed to be lacking. What Roy did not know was that his guess was right this time. In this battle, Heaven's goal was only to destroy the Abyss outpost, meaning that their target was only demons. But it was different for demons. Not only did the demons want to defeat the angel army, but they also planned to destroy the human world below. In order to deal with these two goals at the same time, the war preparations of the demons were naturally much better. This city in the clouds, the White City, was built in the sky, but it was actually in another space. The clouds that could be stepped on were actually just held up by the power of space. After finding that the battle was turning unfavorable, the angels realized that letting the demons run among the clouds was very disadvantageous for them. Therefore, just as the demons were about to attack the city, the angels suddenly removed the spatial power surrounding the White City. The consequences were immediately a little serious. Many demons could not fly, so once the clouds could no longer support them, they immediately fell. But many demons grabbed the angels fighting them when they fell and entangled them tightly, causing the angels to fall with them. And below the clouds was the human world of this world, Earth. The angels and demons entangled and left the space of the city in the clouds. They suddenly appeared in the atmosphere of Earth and fell toward the ground under the influence of gravity. In this process, due to friction with the atmosphere, their bodies immediately ignited with blazing flames and thick smoke as they crashed toward the surface of Earth at high speed. A meteor shower with hundreds of thousands of meteors suddenly appeared in the sky above Earth. When the fighting angels and demons moved the war to the ground of the human world in unison, the true judgment day for humans came. Chapter 133 On the Surface of Earth Humans were observing the large-scale meteor shower caused by the battle between angels and demons. The humans of this world had already developed to the level of modern technology, and they had high-rise buildings and smartphones. When this massive meteor shower appeared and was visible to the naked eye, the news immediately spread all over the world over the TV, radio, and internet. But at this moment, they still did not know what this meteor shower burning with flames and thick smoke and flying toward the ground was. They simply thought that it was a rare astronomical phenomenon. But what surprised the scientists was that the meteor shower appeared without warning, and the human world could not even give an early warning. It was already too late for the people on the ground to take refuge. They could only hope that these meteors were real meteors that would burn away under the friction with the atmosphere. Countless humans were waiting in front of their TVs and various screens, anxiously and curiously observing the situation of the meteors. However, these ignorant people did not know what they would encounter. When the first meteorites crashed into the high-rising building built with steel and concrete and easily destroyed these structures, people suddenly realized what was going on. Panic spread. When the humans discovered that the meteorites had not burned up from the atmosphere, they realized the seriousness of the situation. They scattered like headless flies, running in all directions, not knowing where to go for safety. Meteorites fell one after another, smashing into the ground with massive kinetic energy and destructive force. 
When they hit streets, numerous vehicles flew up and then fell down with loud bangs. Then they exploded into pieces and caught fire. When they hit buildings, hundreds of tons of reinforced concrete fell and buried the people who could not escape in time. When they hit bridges, the entire bridge surface broke apart, and the vehicles driving on the bridge had a large number of re-rent collisions in an instant. Even when these meteorites fell into the sea, they caused huge waves that overturned ships, sinking them into the seabed. At this moment, all of Earth welcomed disasters from the sky. The survivors cried and looked for their loved ones, but driven by curiosity, they gathered at where the meteorites crashed. They carefully avoided the flames on the ground and looked at the enormous craters that were tens of meters deep in fear, wanting to see what kind of meteorites had such great might. However, before they could see clearly, there were huge vibrations in all of these deep craters. As soil was sent surging out, demons and angels crawled out from the bottom of the craters. Before falling, they were still entangled and fighting, but the outcome was basically determined as they landed. When people saw massive demons with hideous faces, holding angels with pure white wings in their hands, or angels with the corpses of demons hanging from the tips of their lances, the humans, who were already extremely terrified, broke down at this moment. The scenes in front of them had already exceeded their understanding. Angels and demons actually existed. Moreover, the meteorite disaster descending from the sky this time was not an astronomical phenomenon, but angels and demons fighting each other. However, neither the demons nor angels would pay attention to the thoughts of these humans at this moment. In the eyes of demons, these panicking humans were delicious souls, especially to low-rank demons. Their main purpose in participating in the war was to obtain souls in chaotic fights. How could they let go of a chance like this? Therefore, they started killing humans as soon as they emerged. They used their strong limbs to knock down the fleeing humans, opened their mouths full of sharp teeth, and bit down without hesitation. While enjoying the flesh, they also devoured the souls. It was the same for angels. They could not care about protecting humans at the moment because demons were everywhere, enemies were everywhere. When they rushed to fight demons, they could not control the impact of the battles from affecting these humans. Just like how angels and demons had fought thousands of times, both sides were frenzied. The only difference was that the battle between the two sides had left the alternate space and had come to the human world. The cities were destroyed, forests were burning, seawater was evaporating, and in the huge explosions, lightning and flames lit up the sky. With the wails of human civilization, doomsday had come. Roy had also come to the surface. He was not stupid. When he saw the clouds collapse earlier, he knew that if he continued to stay in that alternate space, he might encounter a high-level angel, so he did not hesitate to rush out. On the way, he was also entangled by an angel soldier. He killed the angel soldier about a kilometer away from the ground and flapped his wings to stop his fall, avoiding crashing into the ground. However, looking at the disaster happening below and then at the falling meteorites in the sky, Roy finally knew what world he had come to. Damn it! It's actually the Darksiders' world. Not only did Roy recall what kind of world this was from his memory, but he did not expect that he would personally participate in the end war at the beginning of this world. If he evaluated this world, then he was afraid that he would have to say that it was a rather high magic world. Roy had a vague impression of the general plot of this game world, though it was a little blurry. If he did not remember wrongly, it seemed that the humans of this world were rather tragic. In the war between angels and demons, humanity was completely wiped out. Yes. Unlike in other fantasy worlds, the protagonists of this world were not humans at all. In this world, angels and demons had appeared long ago. Like in other worlds, they fought and killed each other, but neither of them could destroy the other. And apart from the angels and demons, this world still had a force known as the Charred Council. And there were some powerful ancient races, but many of them had declined. It was said that the Charred Council was created due to the will of the Creator. A mysterious and powerful organization. Its duty was, in the name of the Creator and in accordance with the ancient laws and contracts, to maintain the balance and order of the universe and punish the forces that threaten the balance. And under the command of the Charred Council, there were the four horsemen of the Apocalypse, representing war, famine, pestilence, and death in the Book of Revelations. These four horsemen of the Apocalypse had unparalleled strength. And with the strength of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Charred Council could even fight against both angels and demons at the same time. Originally, the Council had ignored the war between the angels and demons. After all, the Council was neutral. But as time passed, and this world continued to evolve, humans appeared on it. 
After discovering the appearance of humans, the Chard Council realized that these weak and intelligent creatures would be an indispensable part of the world's balance in the future. Therefore, to protect the newly born human civilization and prevent it from being obliterated by the conflict between the angels and demons too soon, the Council dispatched the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse to force the angels and demons to stop fighting and sign a truce. This truce contract was, of course, not eternal. The Chard Council, angels, and demons agreed that when human civilization matured and was ready, the truce would come to an end. At that time, the three parties of angels, demons, and humans would welcome the final end war. This war would bring balance to all and decide the ultimate fate of the three parties. At the same time, no matter which side remained, the four horsemen of the apocalypse would descend. They would become the hope of the humans, the lords of heaven, or the demons of hell, leading the party with fate to reshape the rules of the world. The truce contract was carried on seven seals. When the seals broke, it meant that the truce was over. This also meant that human civilization was ready, and the end war could begin. But if the angels and demons dared to break the contract and start a war before the seals broke, the council would send the four horsemen of the apocalypse to punish them. The signing of the truce contract did indeed give humans the time and opportunity to develop. However, regrettably, before the humans were truly ready for the end war, the seals carrying the contract were broken. There was a saying that stated that contracts and rules were meant to be broken, and it was no exception here. Roy vaguely remembered that the leader of the angels was impatient and could not wait to destroy the demons for revenge, so he schemed to destroy the seals. However, he did not destroy all seven seals but only six of them, leaving the last seal and hiding its aura. This way, the demons would mistakenly believe that the seals were broken and start the end war first. And as long as the seals did not all break, the powerful four horsemen of the apocalypse would not descend. At that time, as long as the angels could destroy the demons as soon as possible, even the council could not blame them because the demons were the ones who initiated the war. In theory, this sly move was feasible, and the angels indeed successfully misled the demons into taking the lead to gather their troops to attack the angels' base camp, the White City. However, Roy could still remember a point clearly, this sly move of the angels not only misled the demons but also misled war, who represented war among the four horsemen of the apocalypse. War thought that the seven seals had broken, so he responded to the summons and descended to the world. However, after coming to the world, he realized something was wrong, so he fulfilled his responsibility of punishing, not only attacking the demons and also the angels. This was the biggest headache for Roy. Since the war between angels and demons had begun, it meant that war of the four horsemen of the apocalypse would come soon. When the horsemen war descended, he would fully display his strength. He could be said to be nigh invincible, and he was an existence that gave even demon kings headaches. And Roy did not know where this powerful punisher would land. If a middle rank demon like him accidentally bumped into him head on, he would probably be done for. No, this isn't the time to fight blindly with angels. I have to find a way to avoid the time when war arrives. In the air. Roy swayed his tail while pondering. Chapter 134 Fallen Angel Roy looked around as he flew in the air. After a while, his eyes lit up, and he dived down. Below him was a spacious street. Normally, it would be lively with people coming and going, but because of the sudden war, the street was already devastated. Human corpses were everywhere, some houses were burning, and the survivors were trembling as they hid in dark corners. Bang! Roy broke the door of a store on the street and entered. He saw all kinds of books and magazines in a mess on the ground. It was a bookstore. After Roy barged in, he immediately searched for what he wanted in these piles of books. He found it, a world map a world map of Earth. However, Roy was disappointed when he opened the map and saw the design on it. This was because the land of this Earth was completely different from the one he had in his memory. Even the names of the countries, the geographical locations, and the division of the oceans were different. It was a completely unfamiliar earth. Helpless, Roy could only sniff and find the bookstore owner hiding in a cabinet. The bookstore owner was a fat white man. Fortunately, his pot-bellied body could fit into the narrow cabinet. When Roy tore the door off and grabbed him, this guy saw Roy's appearance and peed his pants in fear. Roy frowned and brought him to the map. Answer my question, and I won't kill you. Where is the most powerful country in the world? Show me. Upon hearing this, the owner quickly pointed at the map. Here, it's here. The strongest country is Mers. Then, where am I now? The owner identified it on the map and moved his finger a short distance. Here. Roy was immediately depressed. 
he realized that he was actually in Mers. The purpose of the demon army's war this time was not only to defeat the angels but also to destroy the humans of this world. In other words, the strongest countries would definitely be the strategic targets because they represented the most flourishing human culture and strength and had massive populations. The angels and demons had just descended and caught the humans off guard. Although humans looked weak in front of angels and demons, it would not take long for them to find a way to fight back, especially in such a modern civilized society, where they definitely had a large number of technological weapons. Similarly, the stronger the resistance of humans, the more demon troops they would attract, and the more demons, the more angels. Once both sides gathered, this place would become the main battlefield. Roy felt that if he were war, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, he would definitely choose to descend on this main battlefield. Now that Roy was in this country, when war descended, the chances of him encountering war were very high. He had to find a way to avoid him and go to a neighboring country. Roy threw the fat book's tour owner aside and looked at the map while thinking about which direction to go. If the plot after war descended was the same as in Roy's memory, then it would not take long for the charred council to take away his power. Then he would be killed by a demon lord and return to the space where the charred council was. Because the seven seals were not completely destroyed, the arrival of war was against the rules. He was summoned back to receive punishment, and it would be a hundred years later when he came to this world again. Therefore, as long as he avoided war's arrival at the beginning, Roy did not need to worry about encountering this horseman of the apocalypse for a hundred years. Of course, avoiding the main battlefield was not only to prevent encountering war, but he also had the thought of avoiding the demon and angel big shots. Roy's main task was to take advantage of the destruction of humankind to harvest a large number of souls. If he were to wander around on the main battlefield, not only would he need to compete with other demons for souls, but he might also encounter the big shots and attract attention. At that time, he would probably not be able to play happily. After making his decision, Roy chose to go east because after crossing about 2,000 kilometers, he would reach a coastal country, where his frost power would be able to play its role well. As soon as he walked out of the bookstore, golden lightning flew at Roy. Roy flashed, and the golden lightning entered the bookstore. With an explosion, the store was immediately destroyed. Roy turned around and found the fat owner he had thrown away earlier buried under the collapsed rubble, revealing only his burnt body. Roy shook his head slightly. He flapped his wings, dashed forward, and slammed his shoulder against the angel soldier who attacked him. He flew up with him and smashed him against a wall on the opposite side. With a loud bang, the impact of their collision caused a huge pit in the thick wall. But before the rubble could fall, Roy's frost power exploded, and solid black ice spread from his shoulder to freeze the angel soldier onto the wall. After sealing the enemy, Roy flapped his wings and flew away. He had no time to deal with these angels for now. Roy quickly flew east and encountered many demons and angels along the way. The demons ignored Roy, but a few angels would rush to attack Roy from time to time. If there were only a few enemies, Roy would kill them, but if there were too many, Roy would use flash and break out of the encirclement. After flying for about half an hour, Roy suddenly felt something and looked up at the sky. In the sky behind him, a meteor that appeared brighter and larger, with billowing smoke, was crossing the sky and falling to the ground. Incoming. It must be war. Roy rejoiced that he had moved quick enough. In fact, he had already expected that war would descend after sensing the destruction of the Seven Seals. The same had been true for the demons, so it was foreseeable that it would not take too long for war to descend. If he had not made a prompt decision to leave immediately just now. Roy kept watching war's meteorite fall. Unlike the scene in the game, war created astounding momentum when he fell. The moment the meteorite hit the ground, a powerful light erupted. Even from hundreds of kilometers away, Roy could see the energy contained in the light, feeling as though he was seeing a nuclear explosion in a movie. A few seconds later, a strong vibration came, and the ground beneath Roy began to shake violently. In the sky, Roy stared at the area where war descended with his mouth agape. He knew that the area must have been destroyed. War, who had just descended, was indeed quite terrifying. At this time, he should be at his peak, having power comparable to that of a demon king. The demons and angels still in that area were probably going to be very unlucky. He turned around and continued flying forward. Although he knew that war would not be around for very long, Roy's original plan did not change. However, shortly after he started flying again, a black light suddenly flashed in front of him. Roy slammed the brakes in midair to avoid the ray of light, but then he realized that the ray of light was not aimed at him but merely to stop him from moving forward. 
In the air, a voice suddenly came. Demon. Where do you want to go? The battlefield is behind you. Roy raised his head, and his pupils contracted when he saw a lithe and elegant figure slowly begin to descend. This figure had the appearance of a female angel. But what surprised Roy was that not only was she not dressed like the enemy angels, but even her angel wings were black. A fallen angel? Roy was slightly stunned. He remembered that when the demon army was assembling at the Abyss outpost, he did see a few fallen angels in the formation of the high rank demons from a distance. But he was too far away to see them clearly at the time. And now, one unexpectedly appeared in front of him. Chapter 135 Barrier Troop The female fallen angel in front of Roy was about 1.9 meters tall. Since she had landed from top to bottom, Roy observed her bottom to top. She had a pair of outstanding, fair, long legs. When she landed, one of her legs was slightly bent forward, forming a very beautiful posture. From her feet to her calves, they were wrapped in a pair of black and golden battle boots. She was wearing a gorgeous one-piece battle dress, and the lower hem covered her thighs, while her upper part covered up to her neck. This battle dress had a metallic texture, and there were characters of heaven engraved on it. Since the equipment of angels was made in different worlds and influenced by the local culture, they would have somewhat different designs, but the overall style was still the same. This fallen angel's armor in front of them closely followed the usual style of angels, looking dignified, holy, and solemn. But perhaps because she was a fallen angel, the armor was now black and gold in color and had a faint black aura surrounding it. Coupled with a pair of black angel wings behind her, people could tell her identity at a glance. When this fallen angel stopped descending, Roy saw her face clearly. She was quite beautiful. She seemed to still have the uniquely beautiful and exquisite face of an angel, and after becoming a fallen angel, her dark aura added a bewitching feeling that angels did not possess. Although, in general, Roy really appreciated the appearances of fallen angels and had been thinking about what fallen angels looked like, now that he really encountered one, Roy no longer had the same thoughts as before because this fallen angel clearly came with ill intentions. Who are you? What do you want? Roy asked with a frown. My name is Julia. His Majesty Samael's immediate personal guard, and I'm in charge of the barrier troops. Opposite Roy, Julia said expressionlessly, although I don't want to deal with a demon like you, I have to say that I've been observing you in the sky for a while. You've been flying in this direction, but you've been in a rush when you encounter battles and haven't stopped. What are you doing? Deserting? Hearing this, Roy immediately remembered that fallen angels had a relatively special status in the Abyss and Arania's inherited memories. They were not beings originally of the abyss but transformed from angels or created by high-level demons using the souls of angels. Since fallen angels used to be angels, many demons were not very friendly toward them. Similarly, fallen angels found it very difficult to integrate into the abyss, so they had always been relatively withdrawn. But at the same time, fallen angels had strong powers. Perhaps because of their deprivation, their race had no weak ones at all. The most basic were having the strength and status of high-ranked demons. They often followed demon kings and demon lords as guards or personal guards, making their status extraordinary. This time, in the end war started by the demon army against the angels, thousands of high rank demons had followed. Most of them were the commanders and commanded the demon army to fight, but a small portion of them had the responsibility of being barrier troops. And the fallen angels who followed this time were probably among the ranks of the barrier troops. In the Bible circulated in the human world, Samael was a fallen angel and a demon king who had fallen from the highest level seraph, so it made sense that the demon king's personal guards were fallen angels. But after obtaining Arania's inherited memories, Roy knew that this legend was actually false. Samael was a true abyss demon, and his true body was the king of wrath among the seven deadly sin demon kings. This time, in the end war of this world, only an incarnation of him had come. But it was obvious from the appearance of his incarnation that he was not a fallen angel. The Bible circulating in the human world was nothing more than a revised version of the Heaven Bible. Many truths had long been artificially distorted. Roy felt that the reason why the fallen angels had such a high status in the abyss was probably nothing more than some form of propaganda by the ruling class. It was all to tell the angels of heaven that they had many benefits, such as the five social insurances and one housing fund and paid vacations, attracting them to switch camps to the abyss. After understanding this, Roy was not surprised by the fact that Julia was the Demon King's personal guard. Barrier troop? How ridiculous. The reason why I went in this direction was just to find another place to harvest souls. And you want to pin a charge on me? Since you've landed in this area, you should fight in this area. 
Why do you want to change places? Julia asked expressionlessly. As for harvesting souls, you don't have to worry about it. If the war goes well, His Majesty Samael will reward the warriors who fight bravely, so. Return. Roy's mouth twitched. Fuck, are you blind? War just descended. Didn't you see the huge landing? And you want me to go back and fight? Can't you leave this kind of powerful enemy to the demon big shots? I'm just a middle rank demon, so why are you just staring at me? Roy could not be bothered to talk to Julia, so he rushed toward her. What a rude fellow. Seeing Roy's actions, Julia's expressionless face finally changed. She did not expect that this frost demon in front of her would completely ignore her warning. He was obviously merely a middle rank demon, but he dared to take the initiative to fight a fallen angel. She stretched her hand out, summoned her sword which was a slender, angel-style longsword, and then slashed at the charging Roy. Clang! The sword clashed against Roy's frostmorn. At the same time, Roy's body glowed with a faint red light. With the enchantment of bloodlust, his body suddenly grew much bigger. As a fallen angel, Julia had reached the power level of a high-ranked demon, but looking at her sword, Roy could tell that strength was not her forte. Under Roy's immense strength, she naturally would not have the advantage in this collision. After being sent flying by Roy's sword, she finally stopped. Damn it! Julia cursed. She did not expect this middle rank demon to use this method to fight her. His body suddenly enlarged dramatically, indicating that he was using some kind of spell to increase his strength. Seeing Roy flying toward the east without looking back after sending her flying with his sword, she looked at the battlefield behind her, gritted her teeth, and continued chasing Roy. Her wings flapped quickly and the streamlined wings and smooth feathers gave her a very high speed. Roy's mock flight was already very fast, but Julia followed closely behind at his heels, not falling behind at all, slowly catching up. While flying, Roy looked back in surprise. Julia's flying speed actually exceeds the speed of sound? During the chase, two of them flew hundreds of kilometers away. After feeling that she was close enough, Julia suddenly waved her sword, and a jet black sword beam with dark power slashed at Roy from behind. The sword beam was extremely huge and covered a very large area. In order to avoid it, Roy could only choose to evade upward or downward. As a result, Julia immediately caught up to him. Julia's fighting style was very skillful. Her sword was very fast, and she moved around Roy as she attacked him quickly. The powerful magic power in her sword broke through Roy's defenses and soon left several wounds on his body. And most importantly, she could even use hellfire. The black flames attached to the sword kept burning his wounds forcing Roy to use his frost power to suppress the hellfire. Although Roy was injured frequently under her swift attacks, she was still very vigilant because she had managed to probe that this middle rank demon in front of her was in the midst of promoting. The quality of his magic power was about the same as that of high rank demons. In the collision of magic power, Julia's magic power did not have an overwhelming advantage, and he always offset and neutralized it. All she could rely on now was her speed, combat skills, and having more magic power than the opponent. But at this moment, Roy suddenly held Frostmourne horizontally in front of him, and the demon characters on the sword slowly lit up. Then an enormous force spread out and formed a huge force field. Julia was in this force field, so she immediately felt it. Damn it! How is this possible? This is the expulsion incantation! Julia screamed. Chapter 136 Humans Fight Back this was the first time Roy had used the expulsion incantation on Frostmourne. When he was in the abyss, he had never used it even when facing other demons because it was impossible for him to activate the power of the abyss to expel the beings native to the abyss. But it was different now. This was another world, and the expulsion incantation was effective on all existences from other worlds. What surprised Roy was that the expulsion incantation had a much better effect than what he had imagined because the expulsion incantation formed a force field and not simply a mere force. This change might have been because the system filled in and repaired the demon characters when Roy moved them onto the sword. In other words, what he was now using was the true, complete force of the expulsion incantation. Being in this force field, the pressure on Julia increased substantially, and she could feel the repulsive force of this world pressing against her body with all its might. In the process of angels transforming into fallen angels, in addition to the change in the nature of their magic power, there was also a change in the world power of the abyss. Otherwise, the abyss would not have accepted them, thus allowing them to live in the abyss. But regardless of whether Julia was an angel or a fallen angel, she was an alien existence to this world. To an unwelcomed foreign existence, this repulsive force was simply irresistible. 
Julia could only use her magic power to resist the repulsive force. But this way, not only would she be distracted, but the magic power she could use in the fight would also definitely decrease a lot. It would be alright if her opponent were weak, but the problem was that this middle rank demon was in the promotion phase and not easily dismissed. Damn it! You actually used the expulsion incantation. You're also a being from another world. Since I'm affected, wouldn't you be too? Using this kind of method where both sides lose, aren't you a little too stupid? Under the immense pressure from the repulsive force, Julia gritted her teeth and charged forward to attack Roy, but it was obvious that her movements and speed were much slower. However, as the caster of the expulsion incantation, Roy really wanted to shout, Yes! I'm not affected. When Roy first defined it, Roy had already thought of this situation. He actually used the expulsion incantation in the Demon Bible as a powerful weakening curse, and no one was else exempt. Not to mention high rank demons, even a demon king like Samael would probably be affected. Under the influence of these expelling ripples, the only difference between high rank demons and demon kings was that the demon king could persevere a little longer. But Julia did not know this. She thought that the expulsion incantation also affected Roy, so she wanted to stop Roy and see who would run out of magic power first. After avoiding Julia's attack, Roy flashed behind her and slashed Frostmourne at her wings. She quickly tried to evade, but her speed was too slow, and Roy cut a wound on her wings. The moment the wound appeared, she felt a trace of her strength slipping away. This was Frostmourne's strength absorption, and the strength that was drawn out was now enhancing Roy's. It did not end here. The wound that Roy cut might be small, but it did not even have the slightest sign of healing. Julia had not noticed it at first. But after fighting a few rounds with Roy, she found that her golden black blood was constantly flowing out. Julia only felt her head hurting. She knew she was under a bleeding curse. At this moment, Julia was panting slightly. After all, she had been maintaining a considerable amount of magic power consumption, but on the other hand, Roy did not feel the slightest bit exhausted. Now, she realized that something was wrong. What method is this demon using to become immune to the expulsion force field surrounding us? Damn it, what the hell is with your demon sword? Julia could not help but say. How many curses did you attach to the sword? Indeed, apart from the magic power amplification attribute, the other attributes attached to Roy's Frostmourne were all curse type powers. It could be said that it was a sort of cursing. Roy had done this deliberately. He was very clear that his swordsmanship was not good, so he did not add any other flashy things for Frostmourne's attributes. Other than using it as a magic staff. He mostly thought about how to weaken enemies. Do you still want to fight? You should know that even if you're a high rank demon, you definitely won't be able to stop me. Roy held his sword. You don't have the ability to kill me in one blow, so the longer this drags on, it'll only become more and more disadvantageous for you. Julia was in a difficult position. She had not obtained any advantage when fighting against this middle rank demon, causing her to lose some face. Her magic power consumption was indeed a little too high now and she knew that Roy was right. If she could not kill him in a single blow, she might lose if it continued to drag on. Just as Julia was still struggling, a few black dots suddenly appeared in the sky in the distance. These black dots appeared behind Julia. Roy was facing her, so he noticed them, but she did not. She saw Roy's stunned expression, but instead of looking back, she was suspicious. It couldn't be helped. She had appeared in the abyss for some time as a fallen angel and knew the nature of demons. Thus, when she saw Roy's expression, the first thing she thought of was not to believe him but to doubt him. This demon in front of her was not stupid, so she was afraid that it was Roy's ploy, fearing that Roy would attack her or escape as soon as she turned her head. However, she did not know that it was not Roy's ploy this time. The black dots Roy saw were rapidly getting bigger, indicating that they were some kind of high-speed objects. Seeing these black dots rushing at him, a thought suddenly flashed in Roy's mind. Fuck. Their missiles. Roy quickly flapped his wings and flew away. At the same time, he reminded Julia, be careful and move away. Julia was stunned. This time, she finally turned around, and she was stupefied when she saw the approaching missiles. W what are they? Unlike Roy, Julia had a limited understanding of human technological weapons. Not only her, but many angels and demons did not necessarily understand what kind of technological weapons humans had. This was because science and technology was a very strange thing to angels and demons who used magic power. What humans had that could leave impressions on them were the powerful Templars or magicians in high magic worlds. Now, 
what was coming toward Julia and Roy were a few missiles from tens of kilometers away. Two hours after the end war started, the humans of this world finally reacted and started to organize forces to fight back. Missiles had no magic power, so it was no wonder that Julia could not sense them just now. When she saw them, the missiles were already close. What made Roy want to laugh the most was that her first reaction after seeing the missiles was not to avoid them but to hold her sword in front of her to prepare to cut them down. In the end, these missiles did not directly attack Julia but detonated a little distance away from her. Boom! Boom! The missiles exploded at almost the same time, emitting strong light, ultra-high temperature, and pressure in the blink of an eye. These missiles were fking loaded with thermobaric core heads. Roy avoided far away, but Julia was hit. Thermobaric bombs were powerful destructive weapons. Even though she was a fallen angel, she would not be spared from the impact of the explosion. Roy saw her flying out of the cloud of the explosion. It was not to the extent where she did not even have a body left, but she smashed into the ground like a cannonball. Her ranged armor was in tatters, and her originally beautiful fallen angel wings had many feathers burnt in the explosion. She looked extremely miserable. However, Roy could feel her weak magic power aura. What should he say? She was indeed worthy of being a fallen angel and an existence at the same level as high-ranked demons. Under that huge explosion, she was still alive. Chapter 137 A True Demon Never Looks Back at Explosions In addition to the ignorance factor, the reason why Julia was shot down was also related to Roy. After all, he had made her consume a lot of magic power. Seeing Julia being blasted away, Roy did not bother with her but instead looked at the fighter jets in the distance. Roy knew that the wave of missiles just now was not only to blow up Julia but also him. It was just that Roy had been in the right place and saw the approaching missiles, so he avoided them. This kind of long-range attack was indeed very troublesome. Although angels and demons also had long-range attacks, they were unable to attack from so far. After knowing that he was being watched by the human fighter jets, Roy knew that he had to shoot them down first, or else he would be the one getting hit. Roy knew that the radar technology in this world might be quite powerful. Otherwise, the missiles could not have locked onto Julia and him in the sky. But even if the other party could use their radar to detect him, the second wave of missiles would not arrive so soon. Therefore, Roy took the opportunity to land on the ground quickly. Radar detection was definitely far worse when it came to identifying ground targets. Roy wanted to make these fighter jets misunderstand that both he and Julia were shot down so that they would feel relieved to approach. As expected, not long after Roy landed, several fighter jets flew over. There were 12 of them, and it seemed like they were the attack team flying from a nearby military base. After all, this place was in MERS, the strongest country in the world. Now, the battles between angels and demons were mostly in this country, so besides this attack team, other military forces were probably also dispatched to support it. Looking at the formation of fighter jets flying by overhead and heading in the direction Roy came from, Roy guessed that they might have been passing by and discovered him and Julia, so they released the missiles to attack. Otherwise, it would not have been just a few missiles just now, but a large group of missiles would have attacked. They still needed ammunition to continue with their attack. When the fighter jets flew over, Roy immediately spread his wings and flew up. In order to save fuel, these fighter jets were flying at subsonic speed. With Roy's speed, he quickly caught up to them. It was not until now that the radars of these fighter jets finally detected Roy's presence. The 12 fighters quickly made emergency evasive actions and flew left and right toward both sides. Roy did not care about the other planes as he stared at one of them, accelerated, and landed on it directly. Due to Roy's weight, the fighter jet began to wobble. Roy's claws tightened on the fuselage. He could see a helmet-covered pilot moving the control stick in panic, wanting to fly upside down and throw Roy off. But how could Roy allow him to do this? Thus, he ripped off the protective cover of the plane and revealed a pilot inside. Eject. Ejection. The pilot's response was quick. He knew that there was nothing he could do and that he needed to get out of the cabin. The ejection seat flew up with a bang, but halfway, Roy reached out to grab and intercept it. This scene nearly made the eyes of the other pilots bulge out of their sockets. The pilot in the ejection seat that Roy caught was so terrified that he could not even speak. Roy did not make him suffer anymore. He stretched out his other claw, broke his neck, and grabbed his soul. He then threw the pilot in the ejection seat at another nearby fighter jet. Seeing the seat flying over, the fighter hurriedly evaded. Perhaps because of the pilot's maneuvering being too much, despite the plane managing to avoid the attack of the ejection seat, 
The plane lost its speed the next moment and fell spinning to the ground. Boom! The fighter jet hit the ground, and the pilot could not escape either. Together with the fighter, they immediately turned into a huge fireball on the ground. The pilots and the remaining fighter jets cursed and quickly maneuvered their fighters to circle back, wanting to turn around to attack Roy. But everyone knew that high-speed objects such as fighter jets required a lot of space to circle back. More than 10 seconds had passed when they turned around. At this moment, Roy had violently torn off an air-to-air -air missile hung on one of the wings of the fighter jet that had lost its pilot. This missile was a few meters long and weighed hundreds of kilograms, but Roy threw it like a dart. Care careful. Pull up. Roy threw the missile at the planes flying toward him. Seeing the rotating missile that was attacking in an irregular way, almost all the pilots were dumbfounded. After reacting, they quickly scattered in all directions. They were very clear that the warheads on these missiles were thermobaric bombs. Once the missile detonated, all the fighters in the vicinity would not be spared. The missile dart Roy threw directly destroyed the attack formation that had finally formed. Although he had not hit a plane, in the end, this missile and the fighter that had lost its pilot slammed into the ground one after another, causing two balls of flames to erupt. Roy looked at the fighters rapidly pulling high and knew that they had entered supersonic speed. He could not catch up with his wings, so he did not give chase but activated magic on the spot. With the output of magic power, the surrounding temperature suddenly started plummeting. They were high in the sky, and the cold aura easily affected the clouds. When the pilots returned and launched missiles at Roy from afar, they did not notice that ice was rapidly condensing on their fighters. Facing the incoming supersonic missiles, Roy folded his wings and fell toward the ground in a free fall, making the missiles unfortunately pass by Roy and then detonate in mid-air. There was nothing else apart from blast waves affecting Roy. After finding that Roy, this demon, was not hit, the fighter group started maneuvering again, wanting to dive down and continue to attack Roy. But when the pilots moved their control sticks, they realized that controlling the fighters became exceptionally difficult. Only at this time did they realize their planes were already covered with strange black ice. Not good. We're falling. Losing speed. Can't pull up. Repeat. Can't pull up. Eject. Eject immediately. No. I can't. The cockpit is frozen. In the communication channel, the pilots screamed in panic, and their planes were spinning fast and falling to the ground. When Roy landed on the ground, the remaining ten planes crashed onto the ground, erupting with fireballs and becoming a background scene for Roy. A true demon never looks back at explosions. The technological weapons of humans did indeed have the capability to injure demons, but their weapons were extremely fragile. Perhaps this human counterattack might have some effects on angels and demons at first, but as time passed, the angels and demons would figure out the weaknesses of these weapons, and humanity would come to an end. He did not know if the humans in this world had nuclear weapons or not, and if they would launch them to attack the angels and demons. If they had nuclear weapons, maybe they could destroy some angels and demons. Recalling the scenes after the extinction of the humans in this world in the game, Roy guessed that they had really used nuclear weapons. If he did not remember wrongly, there were some zombie-like human variants in it, which should be because of radiation. TSK, so if I stay in this world long enough, I might be lucky enough to witness a nuclear war and experience a nuclear winter? If there was a nuclear winter, would he not be ecstatic as a frost demon? The power of frost would be everywhere. Of course, the premise was to survive the nuclear explosions. After solving this fighter group, Roy flew back into the sky and continued flying east. However, just as he flew by, he saw Julia, who was still in a coma, below. Right. This lady. This female fallen angel. After landing, Roy stood beside Julia, thinking about how to deal with her. Should I strike while the iron's hot and kill her directly? Roy rubbed his demon horns while thinking. This fallen angel was from the barrier troops and had mistaken him as a deserter. It would be a good choice to solve her, but the problem was that she had said that she was a personal guard of Samael, and Roy could not tell what status this fallen angel had with him. If she truly had some status, then after he killed her, what would he do if this big shot looked into it? Who knew if a Demon King level big shot would have any special means to lock onto the true murderer? Forget it. There's no need to take risks. The Demon King level existences are too terrifying, and it's better to be careful. Instead, for something like being a deserter, it's better to explain it clearly. Plus, if I save her life, it may really turn out alright. After sorting out his thoughts, Roy grabbed Julia's leg and brought her up into the air. This posture was a little strange. Roy glanced and saw Julia's. 
safety pants under her battle dress. He shook his head and flew east with Julia like this. Chapter 138 Each Having Their Own Schemes Just as Roy was taking Julia away, in the battle zone behind him, the newly arrived horseman of the apocalypse, war, was killing everything. Since war represented the power of the Chard Council, both angels and demons viewed him with hostility. When war appeared, the angels and demons attacked him in unison. However, this horseman of the apocalypse with a stigma on his forehead, a red hood, and heavy armor was simply too powerful. He held a large two-handed sword named Chaos Eater and had unparalleled strength and speed. Neither angels nor demons could take two moves from him. When angels faced him, he easily sliced off both of their wings, when demons faced him, he easily cut off their heads. Since he descended, he had been continuously moving forward, and in just ten minutes, hundreds of angels and demons died in his hands. Being killed was not the most terrifying. The most terrifying thing was that the souls of angels and demons could not escape. The souls killed by Chaos Eater would be forever sealed in this sword and then transformed into war's power. However, although he had been fighting against angels and demons all along the way, war always had lingering doubts in his mind. It seems. Something is wrong. Angels and demons are still fighting, and humans are still living. It appears that this is only the beginning of the end war. Why did I sense the summons? Even if the seven seals broke, we shouldn't have been summoned so early. Moreover, where are my siblings? Why can't I sense their existences? Although war had huge doubts, the troops of the angels and the demons were rushing toward him like a tide, making him not have time to consider them. War's temper was not good either. If you want to kill me, I'll kill. You. Therefore, in the following time, war cleared out most of the angels and demons in the city. From the path that he had walked, corpses were strewn all over, the remains of angels and demons everywhere. If Roy had not made the prompt decision to leave this city, he would have likely been among these corpses. However, as time passed, war suddenly discovered that most of his power had suddenly disappeared. W what's going on? The pain caused by the disappearance of the power caught War a little off guard. He could feel that his strongest ability to transform into the Chaos form was no longer usable with the loss of power. Moreover, this loss of power was still going on. He could feel himself becoming weaker and weaker. No. I have to find my siblings and figure out what's going on. War stood up with his sword and continued moving forward. But not long after he started moving, he encountered the most intense battle zone between the angels and demons. Here, he saw a Baton, a high-level angel. His image was very eye-catching because an ornate metal plate covered his right eye. He only had one eye, which he had lost in a previous battle with demons. A Baton was one of the leaders of the Heaven Outpost, the White City. He was the Angel of Vengeance and specialized in fighting, and he was also the frontline commander of the Angel Army. Beside a Baton was a silver-haired high-level female angel with tan skin. Her name was Uriel, a follower of a Baton. At this moment, Abaddon and Uriel were leading a group of angels and wantonly slaughtering the demons that were continuously streaming in around them. But they rarely took action. Only when they encountered some high-level demons would they swing their angelic swords and behead them. Therefore, when war appeared, Abaddon was the first to spot him. He was dumbfounded when he saw war taking heavy steps toward him. Damn! Damn it! Why are you here? Abaddon roared angrily at war. This premature end war was Abaddon's scheme in the first place. He had persuaded another leader of the White City, Azrael, the Angel of Death, to help plan and carry out the Seven Seal Deception Incident. Thus, he was very clear that the last seal of the Seven Seals had not been broken, and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse should not have appeared. But now, war was standing in front of him. This had completely exceeded his original plan. For a moment, Abaddon was confused and muttered to himself, No. This isn't what I wanted. However, War was now even more confused than Abaddon. He did not understand why Abaddon yelled at him as soon as he saw him and even looked dazed. At this moment, a large magic formation suddenly appeared from the ground below Abaddon. With the appearance of this magic formation, the ground immediately turned into magma, and then a giant hand suddenly stretched out from the magma and grabbed the absent-minded Abaddon. This giant hand came from a huge demon, and this huge demon's name was Striga. He was one of the demon lords that Samael had summoned from the abyss. This sneak attack was very successful. When Striga appeared, it happened to coincide with Abaddon's absent-mindedness, and in the sky, Uriel was fighting a high-level demon. After discovering that Abaddon was being attacked, she shouted and swooped down to save him. But it was already too late. 
After Striga's giant hand grabbed Abaddon, he immediately used his tremendous power and clenched fiercely. With a bizarre sound, Striga destroyed Abaddon's angel body. No. Your Excellency. All of this happened too quickly, and Uriel could only watch helplessly as Abaddon's soul was exposed. She rushed forward to try to snatch Abaddon's soul, but a teleportation magic formation suddenly appeared in Striga's palm and teleported Abaddon's soul away. Damn it! Where did you take Lord Abaddon's soul? Uriel flew into a rage and rushed at Striga with her sword. However, Striga burst out laughing, and with a violent wave of his hand, he slapped Uriel flying. Uriel smashed onto the ground and struggled to get back up with her sword supporting her. She turned her head and shouted angrily at war, damn it! What did you do just now? Why was Lord Abaddon so distracted that a sneak attack caught him off guard? However, war had lost a massive amount of power at this time. He knelt on the ground with his sword while panting. How would I know? I merely responded to the summons. Uriel did not get the answer she wanted, so she gritted her teeth, flew up again, and charged at Striga. In fact, the strength of the high-level angels in the outpost heaven had established in this world was weaker than that of the demons. The two leaders in the White City, whether it was Abaddon or Azrael, were not actually high in rank and strength. They were only at the throne level of high-level angels, and Uriel was only at the Dominion level. In terms of strength, only when Abaddon and Azrael worked together could they barely match up to demon king Samael. With such strength, it was no wonder why Abaddon thought of using the Seven Seals to play a trick. Unfortunately, Abaddon had really made a fool of himself this time. Not only had the demon army that Samael summoned exceeded his imagination, but even the four horsemen of the apocalypse had appeared. It could be said that the White City's plan had utterly failed. This blow to Abaddon was extremely huge because he knew very well that all of the forces of heaven in this world might be defeated by the demons. Looking at Uriel and Struga locked in combat, War realized that Abaddon definitely knew something. Now, he could only capture Striga and retrieve Abaddon's soul to understand what was going on. So after raising his spirits, War also joined the battle. With Uriel's help in restraining Striga, he found an opportunity to pierce one of Striga's eyes. However, just as he was about to take this opportunity to defeat Striga, his power was sucked away once again. This was very fatal in the battle. Striga, who had been blinded in one eye, grabbed War and reenacted the previous tragedy of Abaddon. Striga also crushed War's body. Striga, a demon lord famous for his strength, completed the epic feat of double killing a leader of heaven and a horseman of the apocalypse in one day. However, War's soul was not teleported away by a magic formation like Abaddon's had. Instead, it was directly taken away by a ray of light that descended from the sky. The Charred Council was using its power to summon War's soul back. Seeing this scene, Uriel felt a chill run down her spine. She felt that heaven seemed to have fallen into a huge scheme. After thinking for a while, she decisively led the angel army to leave. She did not know where Lord Abaddon's soul was teleported to, and she had to preserve the power of heaven and find a way to retrieve his soul. Ga ha ha! Half of Striga's body was in the magma pool as he burst out laughing. Looking at the defeated angel army departing, Striga took out a demon eye. It was very similar to the demon eye that Roy had created, but it did not have a pair of wings. After seeing no one else around, he whispered to the demon eye, Your Majesty Samael, I've completed the mission and successfully sent Abaddon's soul to Mother Lilith. Good job, Struga. From the demon eye came Samael's voice. You can rest now. Yes, Your Majesty. Struga replied before slowly sinking into the magma and disappearing. And in the space of the abyss outpost, demon king Samael sat on a huge throne with his chin propped up and a sinister smile on his face. He murmured to himself, Lilith. It's up to you next. I hope you don't let me down. Chapter 139 Dark Ritual While Roy was flying, Julia, who he held in his hand, woke up. Julia had been upside down all this time, so when she woke up, her perspective was also upside down. She was very confused for a while before realizing her situation and immediately started struggling. Let go of me. Demon. Julia shouted at Roy. Then. Roy really let go. And as soon as he let go, Julia began falling to the ground. Julia tried to flap her wings and fly, but her efforts were in vain because the feathers on her wings had already been burned under the high temperature of the missile explosion. The black feathers on them were incomplete and could not give her enough upward force. As a result, Julia fell smashing head first to the ground. As this place was a mountainous area, the ground was relatively soft, so almost half of her body sunk into the soil after she fell. Ah! Ah! 
Julia made muffled sounds in the soil, and her long legs exposed outside were kicking desperately. But she could not get herself out of it because she found it difficult to use her strength. Roy was a little speechless as he watched this scene in the air. He could only land and pull her out from the ground. Cough cough. After being pulled out, Julia collapsed onto the ground and coughed violently. When she was buried, a lot of soil went in her mouth, and she felt extremely unwell. After all the mud was out of her mouth, she looked up and shouted angrily at Roy, You! How can you humiliate me like this? Roy spread his demon wings and made a regretful expression. Didn't you tell me to let you go? I let you go, but you couldn't fly. Is that my fault? Hearing this, Julia twisted around to look at her wings. When she saw the hideous sight of her wings and feathers, she pounded her fist on the ground resentfully. Damn it! Those humans can actually hurt me? Although she was a female fallen angel, she was not like a real woman who would pester endlessly about it and be unclear about the situation. After waking up, she immediately recalled the huge explosion before she lost consciousness. Clearly, she had been attacked by a human weapon earlier, causing her to lose consciousness. And while she was unconscious, this frost demon saved her. She forced herself to stand up and restored her expressionless face. Demon. Let's write off our enmity. I won't pursue the fact that you're a deserter nor mention it to anyone. Let's just treat it as though it never happened, okay? After all, she was a barrier troop. Being able to make this promise meant that she had recognized Roy's favor for saving her. Roy nodded readily. No problem. Julia turned to leave, but at this moment, Roy suddenly said, Are you planning to return to the previous city? If I were you, I absolutely wouldn't go back now. She turned back and asked in puzzlement, Why? Because war, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, has descended, and the landing point is in that city. Roy said. You'll be courting death if you go back now. What? Impossible. Hearing Roy's words, Julia was stunned and could not but raise her voice. The end war has just begun, so how could they descend at this time? Julia was Samal's personal guard, so ever since she became a fallen angel, she had always been by his side, staying in this world and participating in the war between heaven and hell. Thus, she knew about and understood the existence of this world's charred council. Behind the four horsemen of the apocalypse was the charred council. It enforced the ancient laws and contracts and maintained the balance of the world. It had set the end war, and it was the final arbiter of the war. If the charred council sent the four horsemen to intervene in the end war at this time, it was akin to a referee ending a competition. This was an action that did not comply with the rules, and with the usual style of the charred council, it was absolutely impossible for it to do such a thing. Therefore, upon hearing Roy's words, her first reaction was to think that Roy was deceiving her. But she did not doubt why Roy knew about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. She thought that Roy had been summoned to this world before and thus understood some of the situations in this world. However, Roy was just casually saying this to her. After all, Julia was the first fallen angel he had encountered after all this time, so it satisfied his curiosity a little. In addition, compared to other demons, Julie could communicate with him, so he casually said this to remind her. But Roy did not need to answer her doubts and suspicions, so he spread his wings and flew up. It's up to you if you believe me or not. I'm leaving. With that, Roy wanted to leave. Seeing that Roy really wanted to fly away, Julia quickly said, Wait. Wait. What now? Roy frowned. All right. Regardless of whether what you said is true or not, I plan on restoring my magic power first before returning. Julia said. But while I restore my magic power, I hope you can protect me temporarily. Julia had no choice but to do this. When the missiles bombed her earlier, she had subconsciously used all her magic power to resist. Now, the magic power in her body was empty, and even her wings were burned. If she went back to the battlefield in this state, even if what Roy had said about the four horsemen of the apocalypse was false, she might be attacked by other angels, so it was definitely impossible for her to go back like this. In exchange, after I restore my magic power, I can use my authority to apply for merits for you. Merits? Roy touched his demon horns. What benefits can I get? Julia was not surprised by a Roy's question. It was the same when dealing with other demons. If there were benefits, you should just say it frankly. She would be outsmarting herself if she tried to beat around the bush, so she explained, you must not have participated in an Armageddon war before. Hmm. Well, let's put it this way. Most of the time, when it comes to large-scale wars with angels, the commanding high-level demons will usually grant merits to the brave warriors who fight. 
In addition to punishing deserters, barrier troops like me also have the responsibility of recording merits. As long as you obtain merits, you can exchange for the corresponding rewards from His Majesty Samael after the war. But first of all, I won't be able to give you too many merits. Exchange for rewards from Demon King Samael? Roy was moved when he heard this. It was a little exciting, so he could not help but ask her, what kind of rewards can I get? Um. That depends on His Majesty Samael's mood. Julia froze for a moment. However, most demons in the past were rewarded with souls. Hearing this, Roy suddenly lost interest. If souls are the only rewards, that would be of little value. Regarding souls, can't I just get them myself? Roy clearly remembered that the humans of this world would eventually become extinct. In other words, in just this world's earth alone, hundreds of millions or even billions of souls would be produced in the end war. As long as he worked a little harder, he might be able to obtain more souls than what he would get from Samael. Is there nothing else? Roy asked. She felt the lack of interest from Roy's tone. If you're unwilling, then forget it. Roy thought about it and finally nodded. All right, it's better than nothing. Okay, let's get started. You hurry to restore your magic power. Julia did not waste any time. She looked around and found a relatively flat place. She then took out her sword and half knelt as she stabbed the sword into the ground. The next second, a magic formation appeared at her feet. Unlike the pentagram magic formations Roy commonly saw, the magic formation beneath Julia turned out to be a nine-pointed star pattern. Julia was in the center of the pattern. With a buzz, a strong black light suddenly burst from the magic formation and soared into the sky, instantly dyeing the sky in the vicinity black. Seeing this scene, Roy finally understood why Julia wanted him to help protect her. This strong black light would be clearly visible from several kilometers away. If angel troops were passing by, they would definitely come to check. Inside the formation, Julia was already floating little by little with the black light. The magic formation seemed to have an air current, causing her long black hair to stand up and flutter slowly. What I'm currently using is a dark ritual. Julia said. This ritual can help me quickly restore my magic power. But during this time, I have to stay inside this magic formation and not move. If an enemy comes, I'll rely on you to resist them. No problem. Roy summoned Frostmourn from the system space and inserted it into the ground. Looking at the sinister appearance of Roy's sort of cursing, the corner of Julia's mouth could not help twitching as she thought back to her battle with Roy and the scene of the power of the world expelling her. This isn't a good memory. At this moment, countless demon characters began to float in the magic formation. These demon characters gathered together and slowly rotated around Julia's body. After seeing the ritual activate, she stopped talking to Roy and concentrated on restoring her magic power. Roy looked at the dark ritual with interest. It seems to be magic that uses dark power. Thinking about it, do fallen angels all use dark power like Julia? When they were angels, they used holy light, but after transforming, they now use another extreme power. It seems like there's no discomfort. How do they do it? Roy had not seen the transformation process of a fallen angel with his own eyes, so he had no way of knowing the exact details for the time being. So despite his curiosity, he did not ask anything and merely stared at Julia. Hmm, speaking of which, after the missiles blasted Julia's armor into tatters, it feels really strange. Strangely big, strangely seductive. Chapter 140 The Fallen Angel Without Memories The magic of the dark ritual could quickly restore magic power. But just like what Julia said, the light produced during the ritual was too eye-catching. A few angel soldiers passing by this area chose to come down and check it out when they noticed the light of the ritual, so they inevitably fought Roy. Of these angels, the rest were easy to kill, but one of them seemed to be a captain and was quite troublesome. Roy took a long time to find an opportunity. He flashed and suddenly appeared beside the opponent, and then he used his frost power to completely freeze him in a huge block of black ice. After fighting so many angels, Roy's magic power consumption was quite high, making him aware of the importance of magic power recovery speed. It could be said that middle rank demons, high rank demons, and even demon lords would face the issue of magic power consumption. Hadn't the high rank demon Zeron been killed by dragons after exhausting all of his magic power? In addition to Zeron, there was a living example with Julia in front of him. If he truly wanted to achieve having an unlimited amount of magic power and endless life, it was probably something only a demon king like Samael could do. So, in his free time after the battles, Roy could not help asking Julia, is this dark ritual demon magic? Can I learn it? In the formation, 
Julia was stunned for a moment before shaking her head. No, it's not demon magic. Strictly speaking, the Dark Elves developed this magic, but there shouldn't be any problem with learning it as long as you know how to use dark power. I see that your magic power is rather strange, seeming to be a mutated result of the combination of frost and dark powers. But the essence of the dark power is still there, so maybe there won't be any problem learning. It. Julia paused for a moment before continuing, but as you've seen, this ritual has many drawbacks. Especially when you're alone, it's best not to use it. Once an enemy interrupts you, not only will you be unable to restore your magic power, but your magic power will also collapse for a while, causing you to fall into danger. Are you sure you want to learn it? Dark Elves? You even learn their magic? Roy asked in surprise. Teach me this ritual. Maybe I can use it. Julia did not waste any time. She pointed at the magic formation beneath her feet and began to explain to Roy. In her opinion, Roy was a rare demon race and had great potential. Not only was he about to become a high-ranked demon, but when she had lost consciousness, he had not abandoned her. In Roy's opinion, a fallen angel like Julia would help him understand the situation of angels and fallen angels, and perhaps he could use her to understand the situation in the abyss where high-ranked demons lived. In addition, Julia herself had a high status, so maybe he could establish a connection with demon King Samael through her in the future. Therefore, in a situation where both sides were more restrained, the two of them were in a very nuanced state of cooperation, and they were both carefully maintaining this cooperative relationship with each other. Roy worked hard to stop the angels so that Julia could recover her magic power without disruption. Similarly, when Roy asked to learn the dark ritual, Julia did not hide anything and explained seriously. Although they had a misunderstanding and fought earlier, they were both in the Abyss camp and were natural allies. When the angel army still existed, it was best for them not to infight. Whenever it came to various rituals, it involved knowledge related to magic formations. This dark ritual was the same. Magic formations usually had fixed geometrical structures and were divided into pentagram formations, six-pointed star formations, nine-pointed star formations, and so on. But in addition to the geometric structure, it required engraving the corresponding magic symbols to form a complete hand. Effective Magic Formation The same pentagram would produce totally different effects when drawn with symbols and demon characters, elven characters, or dragon characters. After acquiring Arania's inherited memories, Roy had completely supplemented his knowledge of demon characters. If the magic formation used demon characters, he might be able to understand it after a while. But the problem was that Julia's dark ritual magic formation was engraved with dark elven characters. The dark elves believed in the Queen of Spiders Loth. In Arania's spider demon inherited memories, she should have memories of the dark elven writing. But for some reason, there was not much about it, so it was very strenuous for Roy to understand these dark elven characters. Roy guessed that it might be because most of the spider demon descendants lived in the abyss, so in the inherited memories left behind by the spider queen Loth, there was more knowledge about demons and less knowledge about other worlds. It was like an ancestor being a wise and far-sighted hero with infinite glory, but his descendants were all mediocre and could only live in a corner of the world and survive with difficulty. Roy finally remembered the dark ritual under Julia's continuous explanation. After he completely remembered it, Roy successfully obtained the skilled dark ritual in the system's attribute panel, meaning that even the system recognized this ability he mastered. Dark Ritual the ability to recover magic power quickly. Although it had the disadvantages of being unable to move and could not be interrupted, it did not matter to Roy. He was different from other demons. If he wanted to use this ability, he had Fat Tiger by his side to protect him. In addition, he was saving his souls to materialize the Cold Winter Armor, which also had the attribute of quickly recovering magic power, so learning the Dark Ritual was merely more out of mental preparedness for Roy. After about 30 minutes, the magic formation under Julia's feet suddenly disappeared, and she stopped floating and fell to the ground. All restored? Quite fast. Roy was a little surprised. He had calculated his own magic power recovery time before, and in 30 minutes, he would only be able to restore about a twentieth of his total magic power. Roy felt that it should be the same for Julia, but with the help of the dark ritual, she recovered to the state of having full magic power. Thinking about this, Roy could not help but feel sorrow for Zeron. Had that fool known such a skill, how could have been beaten so miserably by the dragons? Julia nodded. I'm done. As she spoke, black flames suddenly appeared from her body. The black flames swiftly spread over her entire body, including the wings on her back, making her look like black flames. 
The flames came and went quickly, and before Roy could ask what she was doing, the black flames began to fade away. As the flames dissipated, the damaged black and gold armor on Julia actually restored, becoming bright and new. Especially the black wings on her back, those burnt feathers actually grew out again after the flames faded, covering her wings. The black feathers were incomparably bright and smooth, shining with black light. Not only that, but Roy also saw another pair of black wings under her black wings, though they were smaller. She seemed to have been reborn under these black flames and returned to her original state. Her entire body was brimming with magic power. Four-winged angel? Is this your power at your peak? Roy asked in surprise. Also, what were the flames on you just now? I remember that Hellfire doesn't have such a healing ability, right? It even managed to repair your damaged armor. Ah, uh, I'm using Hellfire, but it's different from ordinary Hellfire. Julia hesitated but still explained. Because I knew how to use Holy Flames before I transformed, after the transformation, a bit of the power of Holy Flames appeared in the Hellfire I fused with and can repair my wounds. Holy Flames? Is it that meaning of Holy Flames? Roy pondered but did not ask. He could tell that Julia did not want to mention the things before her transformation. After all, she was once an angel but was now a fallen angel and became enemies with her former comrades. Roy guessed this, but he did not know that he was wrong at this time. In fact, if angels chose to fall, they would be able to retain their original memories after becoming a fallen angel. But if their souls fell into the hands of demons and were forcefully contaminated and transformed, they would lose all their memories of when they were angels. Julia was the latter. Her soul had transformed when it fell into the hands of Samael. She could not remember the past, so she was generally unwilling to mention things related to her past memories. She also knew that even if she could regain her memories, she would not be able to return to heaven. This was what it meant to go deep into hell and become a stranger from now on. A loud roar came from the sky at this moment. Roy and Julia both looked up and found that it was a group of human planes. There was a very large number of them, and not only were there a large number of fighter jets but also bigger bombers and some airborne early warning and control aircraft. It was a complete combat group, and it seemed that the humans had still not given up on their counterattack. Seeing the fighter jets, Julia remembered the scene of her being blasted by missiles and could not help but turn cold. Human weapons. It seems like it's true. Humans are indeed prepared. It was not in vain that angels and demons started the decisive battle of Judgment Day. Hearing this, Roy did not know what to say. Julia was obviously wrong. Although human weapons were powerful, they were still far from enough to deal with angels and demons it was absolute nonsense to say that they were prepared. Facing the demon army led by the demon king and the heaven army led by high-level angels, humans did not have much room to fight back. Only by using nuclear weapons would they be able to drag some enemies down with them. But once they used nuclear weapons, humanity was finished. I'm leaving now. I have to report the situation about the humans to His Majesty Samael," Julia said. In addition, the four horsemen of the apocalypse arriving so early is also different from what His Majesty expected. If he doesn't take action, I'm afraid that no one can stop the four horsemen. At this point, she looked at Roy. Since you want to avoid the four horsemen, go farther away. The battle between His Majesty and the four horsemen will probably affect most of the world. Roy continued to be speechless. No girl, you're wrong again. The four horsemen of the apocalypse might not be able to wait for Samael to take action. She spread her wings and flew up. Before leaving, she suddenly asked, that's right, demon, what's your name? Osiris. Roy replied. Then, goodbye. Julia did not say anything else and turned to fly away. Chapter 141 The Kill Stealer Must Die. Roy was not too surprised by Julia's departure. After all, she was a direct subordinate of Samael and had to return to his side. Spreading his wings to fly, he continued moving in his original direction. In the process, Roy was trying hard to recall the plot from his memories. In his impression, War, one of the four horsemen, did not stay in the human world for long before the Charred Council summoned him back and imprisoned him. When he reappeared, it was already a hundred years later in the human world, and humans were already extinct. Therefore, the battle between War and Demon King Samael that Julia mentioned earlier would not actually happen, and Roy did not need to run too far. However, there was another situation that Roy was worried about. During the time when War was imprisoned, Demon King Samael seemed to have been sealed. Yes, a Demon King like Samael was also sealed. Although Roy could not remember exactly who caused it, 
He still had a vague impression that when war returned a hundred years later, it seemed that the final boss was not Samael. In other words, in these hundred years, another Demon King level fellow had appeared in this world and fought Samael. Although he was unable to kill Samael, he had used other means to seal him. Therefore, it did not mean that Roy did not need to worry about anything else after avoiding war. Of course, this should happen in the next hundred years. The time span was too long, and Roy did not know when it would happen. It was useless to think too much about it now. After flying for about two hours, Roy finally arrived at his destination. He had seen on the map that this was a seaside city in Mers. The area of this city was rather large, about 1,200 square kilometers, and the population was around 8 million. It was one of the largest cities in all of Mers. When Roy arrived in the city and looked down, he found raging fires in many places in the city and thick black smoke slowly rising out of high-rise buildings. From time to time, gunshots and explosions rang out in the city, and the entire city reverberated with the terrifying sounds of air raid alarms. From the looks of it, when the clouds collapsed, many demons and angels had fallen into the city and then ignited a war here. However, this place was not the main battlefield after all, and Roy guessed that there would be fewer high-level angels and high-level demons here. Flying toward the center of the city from above, Roy saw the paralyzed traffic and people escaping. Many human soldiers were mustering their courage to fight against the angels and demons. They drove tanks and armored vehicles through the city and were constantly firing at angels and demons with these heavy weapons. A loud noise came from the side. Roy turned his head to the left, only to see a black military helicopter fleeing in panic. Behind this helicopter was a huge bat demon. It kept making evasive maneuvers, trying to get rid of the bat demon's pursuit, but in the end, it was all in vain. The huge bat demon pounced on the helicopter's tail from behind, grabbed the fuselage tightly with his claws, and then bit the tail off. The helicopter that lost its balance immediately chose to crash into a building with the bat demon. But just before the impact, the bat demon flew away from the helicopter. Boom! With a loud explosion, the helicopter turned into a large fireball, and the blast wave of the explosion shattered the glass of the building. The bat demon flying in the air burst out in ear-splitting laughter. He opened his mouth and spat out a few large fireballs, bombarding the middle of the building. Perhaps it was because the bat demon's attack hit the support pillars, but the building actually started to tilt during the explosions. The people taking refuge in the building screamed in horror. They slid out of the tilting building and fell from tens of meters into the ground, turning into meat paste. Some people managed to grab supports with their hands and did not fall out, but the moment the building collapsed, they still failed to escape the fate of death. The ground trembled when the building fell over, and tens of thousands of tons of reinforced concrete smashed the ground, creating a tremendous amount of smoke and dust that even the sea breeze could not blow away. This massacre probably brought over a thousand souls. But before the bat demon had time to celebrate, a golden longsword pierced his back. A angel with two big wings, holding a shield in his left hand and a longsword in his right hand, had dived from the sky and pierced the chest of the bat demon. The bat demon screamed and rolled desperately in the air, trying to get rid of the angel warrior. But the angel warrior gripped the longsword firmly and leaned close on the bat demon's back. The angel and demon fell to the ground together and resumed their battle. When the battle reached its end, and the bat demon was about to kill the angel, a large shell suddenly flew over and hit the bat demon. The immense force smashed the bat demon's huge body into the air. The muzzle of a tank was emitting smoke. The angel warrior climbed up and tried to pick up his longsword while panting, but a dense burst of bullets hit him, creating sparks all over his armor, causing his entire body to shake. Dozens of human soldiers following the tanks started firing at the angel with heavy machine guns. The attacked angel was furious. He picked up his longsword and shield without a word and rushed forward under the rain of bullets. He swept away these human soldiers and then split the tank in half with one stroke of his sword. In the distance, the bat demon that was sent flying by the tank shell stood up. He shook his head, feeling a little dizzy, but after seeing the angel warrior, he made a strange cry and rushed forward. Similar scenes were happening all over the city. Here, humans, angels, and demons, these three parties had already killed until their eyes were red, and it was impossible to stop. Under the watchful gaze of the demon eyes, Roy could see the light of souls floating in the entire city. Most of the souls were hovering above the ground but a small number were slowly floating into the air. Some angels were collecting these souls floating in the air, while most of the souls on the ground were in the hands of demons. However, there were simply too many souls, 
and the demons and angels in combat might not be able to take away every soul. Roy descended onto the top of a building and took out a system creation he had prepared beforehand from the system space. It was. A flag. In addition to the dark color, the Osiris mark on the flag representing Roy was slightly attractive. It was a hexagonal snowflake pattern. He pierced the flag into the concrete of the building and stood beside it as he poured magic power into it. The next moment, the flag began to flutter, and the Osiris mark on the flag slowly glowed. With the activation of the flag, the souls scattered within a kilometer radius around the building began to gather toward the flag. Roy called this flag the soul attracting flag. He had already expected that there would be a large number of scattered souls in this bitter end war. It would be too time consuming to collect them one by one, so Roy specially made this thing. This soul attracting flag did not have any other special uses. It could only attract souls in a large area after being activated by magic power, similar to a simplified and enlarged version of the Osiris mark. He had gotten rid of the attribute of teleporting souls across worlds but increased the range of the attraction. In the end, he used up less than 40 souls to make it, which was cost effective. A large number of big and small souls flew toward Roy's location. Probably because they were too fast, these balls of light even left traces of light. As soon as the souls reached Roy, he immediately stored them in the system space. Finally, he obtained 1748 souls. Roy happily removed the soul attracting flag from the concrete before flying with it, landing on another building nearby, and doing the same thing again. This method of wantonly harvesting souls naturally attracted the attention of angels and demons. This was definite. After Roy changed four places in a row, a group of demons could no longer stand it anymore. Fuck. We worked so hard to kill so many people below, but you took away our souls before we could? The kill stealer must die. As a result, after sensing Roy's position, a group of angry demons jumped onto the building he was on and climbed up along the surface of the building to go and kill him. Chapter 142 Protection Money Boom! Boom! Several demons climbed up along the building. These demons were not light in size and weight. As soon as they jumped onto the building, the ground shook. In the air, a few winged demons were circling the building and staring at Roy with malicious intentions. A demon with a big mouth and sharp teeth crawled toward Roy on all four limbs. His mouth was dripping with saliva, and the saliva fell onto the ground and instantly corroded the ground until smoke rose. When he arrived not far from Roy, he stopped and roared unclearly, Despicable. Thief. Those, souls, mine. You, can't snatch. The other demons behind him did not say anything but faintly surrounded Roy. Demons viewed the end war as a carnival. The massive number of souls in the city made them ecstatic, but not every demon could immediately devour souls right after killing enemies because of the interference of angels. There would always be delays because of various reasons. Roy used the soul attracting flag to collect these souls that the demons had yet to take away, so the demons naturally viewed him with hostility, feeling that Roy had snatched their stuff. In the distance, some angels saw the gathering of demons on the top of the building, but they wisely chose to observe. Compared with the angels, the chance of demons in fighting was naturally higher. But facing the rebuke of these demons, Roy suddenly spread his demon wings. Under the infusion of magic power, the demon runes on his wings lit up, and the halo of fear spread, covering the entire top of the building. Frostmorn stabbed into the ground, and formidable frost power blossomed, causing the surrounding temperature to plummet by tens of degrees. Roy raised his head and bared his fangs at the demons. If I want to snatch, I'll snatch. What about it? Did you come up to court death and deliver your souls to me? On this battlefield, low rank demons had no status at all. Even if the souls they hunted were snatched away, they did not have the courage to say anything. High rank demons generally acted as commanders and dealt with high level angels, and it was unlikely that Roy would snatch their souls. Thus, these demons who came to cause trouble were all middle rank demons. Therefore, once Roy released his power, these demons immediately felt threatened. Putting aside Roy's halo of fear, the suppression that belonged to high rank demons coming from Roy became clearer and clearer. When these demons felt the suppression from Roy, they could not help but take a few steps back. They realized that they had encountered a tough opponent. This guy who had snatched their souls turned out to be a demon in the midst of promoting. It could be said that Roy was only a step away from becoming a high rank demon. After he compressed the last wisp of magic power in his demon heart, he would become a full fledged high rank demon. But these middle rank demons who came to find trouble with him had yet to even reach the threshold for promoting. 
abyss demons were a race that advocated power, and the strict hierarchy system had been buried in their bloodlines for millions of years. So when Roy released his power, the demons at the outermost edge stepped back and turned to flee. The winged demon circling in the sky also quietly flew away. Only a few top middle rank demons, including the demon salivating with acid, hesitated. They were unwilling to let Roy snatch a large number of souls. In their opinion, although Roy was not someone to be messed with, he had yet to promote and was still a middle rank demon. Perhaps if they worked together, they could win. At the same time, these demons had a strong sense of envy toward Roy. They were very clear that once they became high rank demons, their status would change. Many demons dreamed of this promotion, but they could not do it yet, so it would be a lie to say that they were not envious when they discovered Roy's situation. Roy could roughly guess what these demons were thinking from their distorted expressions and eyes, but he did not care what they were thinking. He had already given them the opportunity. If they did not want to leave, then they could stay here for him to harvest. He stretched out his left hand and suddenly raised it, and formidable magic power erupted from beneath the salivating demon's feet. A sharp black ice pillar soared into the sky in less than half a second, piercing through the stomach of the salivating demon. This black ice pillar was tens of meters tall, and it hung the demon in midair in an instant. The other demons quickly moved away when Roy's magic power erupted. But unexpectedly Roy waved his hand, and several ice spears materialized in the air. They flew toward these demons to block their escape route. Roar. Realizing the danger, these demons all roared and used their magic power to fight back. One of the demons opened his mouth and spat out a shock wave formed by the power of darkness while two other demons ignited with blazing flames and waved their hands to fire fireballs. Unfortunately, their magic could not stop or cancel out Roy's ice spears at all. Roy's black ice spears broke through their magic and pierced into their bodies. Although he was still a middle rank demon, Roy's magic was now completely different from the past. The compressed magic power brought about a qualitative change in magic. It could be said that the magic he cast with the same amount of magic power was now at least twice as powerful as before. This was the most essential difference between high rank demons and middle rank demons. Roy's eyes spears pierced through the three demons at the same time, but they did not pierce their hearts. Even so, the three demons screamed loudly. But before their voices died down, Roy flashed behind them and waved Frostmourne, instantly cutting the waists of the three demons with a powerful force. Purple blood splattered. These demons had paid the price for their hesitation just now. After taking the souls of the three demons, Roy looked up at the demon pierced by the ice pillar. Although the ice pillar had pierced a big hole in his abdomen, he was still alive. The demon's vitality was very strong, but the magic power virus contained in the black ice pillar was rapidly devouring his magic power, leaving him unable to fight back. Don't. Kill me. The demon said weakly to Roy. You, powerful. I, willing. Submit. This was a choice that many demons usually made when facing stronger demons. However, this situation rarely occurred among demons of the same rank. Such words showed that this demon, like her and Ian before, was really afraid of Roy. Roy thought about it and then pointed his claw at this demon from afar. He used psychokinesis to break the ice pillar at the top and let this demon down. The situation here was slightly different from in the abyss. Back in the abyss, Roy had no place to use Arania. Moreover, he could not trust Arania's loyalty, so he directly killed Arania and took her inherited memories. However, this demon did not seem to have any inherited memories worthy of Roy's attention, so it was better to treat him as an accomplice that helped him collect souls. If I had known earlier, I wouldn't have killed the other three demons so quickly. There were too many souls here, and Roy alone had limited efficiency. I can let you go and let your pathetic soul continue to stay in your ugly body. Roy said to the demon attempting to pull out the remaining ice pillar from his body. But you need to sign a demon contract with me. Yes, your excellency. The demon replied with a grimace. He was in pain. Roy waved his hand, and a demon contract appeared in front of them. The content of the demon contract was very simple. Roy would let this demon go and not kill him, but as the price, 20% of the souls this demon obtained in this world would automatically pass through the power of the demon contract and be handed over to Roy. To put it bluntly, Roy was collecting protection money. As long as this demon was not killed by angels or other enemies in the future, he would have to hand over 20% of the souls he obtained to Roy. After seeing the content of the contract, the demon signed his demon name on it without another word. And so, the contract was established. I, leave now, Your Excellency? The demon asked carefully. Roy nodded. 
feeling relieved, the demon quickly covered his wound and jumped down from the top of the building. Roy was not surprised that this demon had signed a contract so readily. Roy's method of collecting protection money was not actually uncommon among demons. Many high-ranked demons did this, and they were even more exploitative. Back in the Heroes of Might and Magic world, Xeron had done this. Moreover, he was more extreme. All the spoils of war belonged to him, and he had only distributed a small portion to the demons below. Even after signing a contract with some high-level demons, Xeron actually obtained about 50 to 60 percent of the spoils. Compared to that, Roy's protection money was only 20 percent, which was already quite generous. Roy was not a true high-ranked demon yet, so he could not command these demons to fight and harvest the spoils of war for him. But he could use this method to find more demons to sign demon contracts. It could be regarded as a disguised form of reaching the same purpose as that of high-ranked demons. At that time, not only would he use the soul attracting flag to collect souls, but he would also have a large group of contract workers under him. The speed and efficiency of earning souls would definitely increase a lot. Chapter 143 Perishing Together Over the coming days, Roy kept collecting souls in the city. In addition to him collecting them personally, Roy developed a batch of downlines. They were all top middle rank demons forced to sign contracts after Roy ruthlessly beat them. There were about 70 of these demons, and they could bring Roy at least a thousand souls every day. But as time passed, the name of Demon Osiris gradually spread. His appearance as a frost demon was very easy to identify, so many middle rank demons avoided him after recognizing him and no longer gave him the chance to attack. Helpless, Roy could only stop this enslavement method because he found that not only were middle rank demons avoiding him, but even some high rank demons in this city noticed him. The high rank demons certainly did not want more demons to compete with them for souls. But they noticed that Roy was about to promote, so they did not attack him and maintained a certain degree of restraint. Compared to the high rank demons, the angels did not have so many reservations. On the contrary, as long as Roy appeared, he would often be attacked by a large number of angels in this area. It seemed that the angels did not want another high level demon to appear, so they were all thinking of ways to kill him in the cradle. After realizing this situation, Roy tried to avoid the angels as much as possible, afraid of accidentally encountering high-level angels. After coming out to collect souls every day, he found a place to focus on compressing his magic power. Even so, the number of souls Roy possessed kept increasing, from 30,000 to 50,000 and then to 70,000. He was getting closer and closer to his goal of 100,000 souls. Just like that, a month passed. And during this month, the humans of this world had suffered heavy losses. Take the city Roy was in for example. A city with millions of people had almost turned into a ghost city within merely a month. The organized regular army had long been exhausted from the war with angels and demons. Although the powerful technological weapons of humanity posed a threat to angels and demons, unfortunately, these powerful weapons usually needed a long period of training to master. If the soldiers who knew how to operate them were killed, it would take a long time for new operators to complete the training and replenish their forces. During this period, these weapons could only become decorations. Humans had still been able to use tanks, helicopters, and fighter jets to counterattack at the beginning. But later on, they could only use ordinary firearms to protect themselves and counterattack. And these ordinary firearms posed even less of a threat to angels and demons. The city was now completely reduced to a battlefield where angels and demons fought every day. Human figures could no longer be seen on the ground, and all the survivors hid in sewers, underground bomb shelters, and so on. Their numbers had also dropped to an incalculable extent, and they could only live like the rats in the gutter. Even though they were hiding in these dark corners, humans were still dying in large numbers. Every day, when Roy collected souls with the soul attracting flag, he could always collect ownerless souls from some corners. Clearly, these dead humans had died due to the lack of food and medicine. Regarding this situation, Roy could only sigh. He knew very well that in such an Armageddon war, human cities could no longer carry out any production, and there was only death for the survivors here. On the other hand, the survivors hiding in remote mountains might be able to find a way to survive, and they might even be able to build facilities like refuges and obtain food through farming with the strength of a few people. However, this was merely struggling at death's door. If humans were unable to expel angels and demons, sooner or later, humanity would eventually perish over time. Although Roy had human thoughts and felt sympathy for the humans of this world, feeling as though they had encountered an unexpected disaster, Roy was helpless concerning this situation. 
he was only a middle rank demon and could not influence this Armageddon war at all. However, as a former human, Roy understood human nature quite well. As the resistance of humans became weaker and weaker, Roy became more and more vigilant. He was very clear that despite the human race being small and weak, it absolutely should not be underestimated. Their personalities were two-sided. It could be said that they had the love and kindness represented by angels and also the ruthlessness and viciousness represented by demons. When they realized that their extinction was imminent, they would definitely be ruthless enough to perish together with the angels and demons. They might even stake everything and completely destroy this world. Since they could not obtain it, then the angels and demons should not even think about it. Therefore, Roy did not idle during this time. He found a place and dug a very deep cave. On the 66th day since the end war started, everything happened as Roy had expected. At midnight on this day, humans used their final means of retaliation. Hundreds of intercontinental missiles appeared at the same time from under the water in the depths of the ocean and the military bases hidden in the mountains. These intercontinental missiles were all deadly weapons with nuclear warheads. The missiles were huge, and thick flames and white smoke spewed out from their tails. They were propelled by the powerful force high into the atmosphere. In the dark night, these missiles looked like meteors in reverse, appearing dazzling and determined. Many angels and demons discovered this scene. They knew that these missiles were human weapons, but they did not understand what they meant, thinking that they were just like the missiles that attacked them in the past. Therefore, despite trying to intercept these human weapons, they found that they could not intercept these missiles at all. After falling down from the atmosphere, the speed of these intercontinental missiles reached an astounding ten times the speed of sound. Such speed was something that even angels and demons could not catch up to. This night, in the various large cities of this world, the main battle zones of angels and demons all welcomed a blinding flash. The dark night sky completely lit up. From afar, you could see mushroom clouds rising from the ground. Intense high temperatures and blast waves swept across millions of square kilometers of Earth. Vast numbers of angels and demons turned into ashes under the high temperature and blast waves, and then not even ashes were left. There was no need to mention low and middle rank demons and low level angels. Even some high level angels and high level demons died in the sea of flames in this global attack because of inadequate protection. The coastal city Roy was in was also hit by a nuclear bomb. An aircraft carrier fleet had appeared in this coastal city before. But this fortress sailing on the sea did not last long before being sunk by angels and demons. Only the nuclear submarines hiding in the deep sea managed to escape this disaster. After all, most angels and demons were active on the ground and the sky, and they could not bother with the seabed. The nuclear bomb that attacked this city was launched by a nuclear submarine in the seabed hundreds of kilometers away from the coastline. The moment the nuclear warhead landed, Roy felt a huge sense of crisis, so he hid in the cave he dug in advance and condensed a thick layer of black ice for a second layer of protection. The hot flames even exceeded the temperature of the flames of the abyss, and the ground and air became blisteringly hot. Roy hid in the cave, and his black ice was constantly melting, so he had to replenish it unceasingly with magic power. Fortunately, this situation did not last long. When Roy emerged from the cave with lingering fear, he saw a scorched land comparable to the abyss. The Tau buildings were gone, leaving only some foundation and rubble. Rocks turned into magma, trees turned into black ashes, and scorchingly hot winds blew. On this day, Humans used their technological strength to fight a decisive battle of Judgment Day against angels and demons. Chapter 144 Demon Merchant The blast waves were still blowing thick smoke and dust into the atmosphere, and the sky was gradually dimming. Even at night, the starlight and moonlight had disappeared. Roy knew that this was due to a massive amount of dust gathering in the atmosphere. This dust would stay in the atmosphere for the next few months and block all light from the sun. During this time, because there was no sunlight, the plants on the ground would wither and die, causing further destruction to the ecosystem. The temperature of the entire earth would welcome a huge drop. Perhaps when the snow fell, the dust in the atmosphere would slowly fall to the ground with the snow, but this process was extremely slow. Until the sun could shine on the earth again, the nuclear winter would continue. Roy held the soul attracting flag and continuously poured magic power into it as he wandered around the city that had completely turned into ruins. Wherever he went, scattered souls would be attracted and fly towards him. These souls should belong to the human survivors that hid underground. They could have lived a while longer, but because of the nuclear attack, they died. After all, without a solid bunker, it was impossible to protect against nuclear radiation and high temperatures. Roy knew that many angels and demons had definitely died in this nuclear attack. 
However, due to the special nature of the souls of angels and demons, it was impossible to obtain these souls if they were not caught the moment they were exposed. The bodies of angels and demons might have burned to ashes under the high temperatures and blast waves, but the Ouroboros mark protected their souls. Of course, the dead angels and demons did not return to the abyss or heaven but instead resurrected in the abyss outpost in the White City. The alternate spaces opened by demon kings or high-level angels had certain characteristics of the abyss or heaven and could function as resurrection hubs for angels and demons. They only needed to recuperate for a while to recover from their injuries, and then they would appear in this world again. They were only temporarily expelled and not truly killed, but humans did not understand this. The temperature had already begun to drop, and Roy felt his magic power becoming active. Currently, compressing his magic power became exceptionally smooth and fast, and more than that, but Roy found that his body was experiencing some kind of special agitation. At first, Roy did not understand what was going on, but then he saw a high-rank demon. This high-rank demon was a traditional abyss demon with crimson skin. In addition to a pair of curved demon horns on his head, he also had a sharp horn on his forehead. However, perhaps because of the impact of the nuclear explosion earlier, half of his body was burned, and bones and dangling flesh could be seen all over. Even his wings had one side broken off. After all, not every demon had been prepared like Roy. But he had still not died and been expelled with such serious injuries. The magic power in his body was empty, but under his powerful self-healing ability, the dangling wounds were squirming and gradually healing. This high-rank demon was squatting in a pile of rubble and panting heavily. When Roy appeared, he immediately glared at Roy fiercely. However, Roy did not intend to take advantage of him and merely observed him from a distance. Because Roy discovered that while the wounds of this high-rank demon were gradually healing, there seemed to be some anomaly. On the burnt half of his body, some strange small scales appeared while his wounds healed. He definitely did not have these scales before. It was obvious when he compared them with the more intact side of his body. These scales were the anomaly that Roy mentioned. Wherever the wounds of high-ranked demons healed, these scales would spread to form a new protective membrane. It was not only this high-ranked demon. When Roy continued to wander around and found some demons who were also recovering from serious injuries, he discovered that this anomaly appeared on most demons. Roy gradually understood that this was probably due to the radiation after the nuclear explosion. Demons had always been living in the harsh environments of the abyss. This not only caused demons to be stronger but also gave them strong adaptability to high-risk and harsh environments. After all, those that were not adaptable would definitely not be able to survive. Now that the nuclear bomb had exploded, the radiation in this city could be said to be terrifyingly strong. The bodies and cells of these heavily injured demons were exposed to this fatal radiation and if they did not evolve, they would die. Therefore, their bodies spontaneously underwent mutation and evolution to help them resist this fatal radiation. The agitation in Roy's cells was probably also from this. He had used the T-virus in the past, and his cells were almost perfect. In other words, he had a better ability to adapt and evolve. Now that he was walking around the city, the radiation contamination he received was very strong. Under the stimulation of the external environment, Roy's body was undergoing changes. The evolutionary ability of demons corresponded to the quote, that which does not kill us only makes us stronger. On the other hand, the angels were on the verge of dying. Roy discovered some surviving angel soldiers in the ruins, but after careful observation, he found that there was no corresponding adaptation phenomenon on these angels. Under the intense radiation, these angel soldiers looked extremely weak, and even if their bodies were not burned, large areas of festering appeared. When the angels saw that a demon had discovered them, despite wanting to resist, they found that they could not even hold their weapons. When the nuclear bomb exploded, not only did they exhaust their magic power but also their physical strength. Just. Justice will come. You. You won't succeed. When Roy found a four-winged angel, he was also unable to fight. He was a captain and had led other angel soldiers to fight against demons earlier, but now, he could only glare at Roy angrily and say this catchphrase. Before Roy could say anything, a voice suddenly came from behind him. Ah Tilda! What a weak oath! Isn't that right? Roy was shocked. He turned around and found that behind him was a demon floating in the air. This demon was slender and had a pair of demon horns on his head, but he had a skull-like face. His sharp black claws intertwined and rubbed each other. Roy did not know if it was an illusion or not, but when he looked back at him, his skull-like face revealed a humble and flattering smile. However, 
he clearly had powerful magic power fluctuations and did not lose to other high ranked demons at all. You are. Why are you behind me? Roy asked, looking at him cautiously. Aha, don't be nervous. The demon spread his hands. My name is Volgrim, a rift demon. Hmm? Roy carefully sized him up and finally remembered that this demon seemed to be the demon merchant who had traded with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He actually appeared here? However, what Roy did not expect was that Vulgrim was a rift demon. Similar to frost demons, rift demons were also a rare race of demons in the abyss. Rift demons had a special ability. They could travel between the gaps of space, freely passing through the gaps of space to come and go to various spaces. Because of this special spatial ability, even though rift demons were rare, they were very famous in the abyss. Hearing this, Roy understood why he could silently appear behind him. What do you want to do? Roy first looked at Vulgrim, then at the four-winged angel he was holding. He suddenly reacted. Do you want the soul of this angel? Of course. Vulgrim rubbed his claws with a greedy expression. But don't misunderstand. I don't want to snatch it from you. I know the name of Demon Osiris. I just want to make a deal with you. Chapter 145 Artificial Angels What Roy did not know was that before he found this four-winged angel commander, Volgrim had been waiting by the side for a long time. He was waiting for this angel commander to die. It couldn't be helped. Although Volgrim was a high-ranked demon, he did not seem to like fighting. Or rather, he was simply not good at fighting. When he discovered the heavily injured angel commander here, he did not immediately finish him off and take his soul but instead chose the safest option and waited for him to die. Moreover, he had waited very far away. He was extremely timid and cautious. However, Vulgrim did not expect Roy would roam over and immediately discover this angel commander buried in the rubble and dig him out. Vulgrim felt as though he was about to fail on the point of success, but he absolutely would not come out and compete with Roy for the ownership of the angel commander's soul. So after thinking about it, he decided to do his usual profession and appeared behind Roy intending to make a deal with him. Hearing this, Roy immediately understood, so he tightened his grip and broke the neck of the angel commander. Then he grabbed the golden soul floating out of the angel commander's body and stretched it out in front of Vulgrim. Is this what you want to trade with me? Aha! The holy soul of a four-winged dominion angel. Vulgrim looked at the soul greedily. He extended his claw, wanting to take it, but Roy suddenly withdrew his hand, making him grab at nothing. This golden angel soul was a middle-class holy soul in the system display. It was different from the souls of low-level angel soldiers, so Roy also realized that this soul might be relatively precious. How could he let Volgrim get it so easily? Looking at Roy's teasing eyes, Volgrim feigned coughing to hide his embarrassment. Then he pointed at the angel commander's corpse. And the angel core. I want the angel core too. Roy glanced at him without saying a word. He stretched out his hand and his sharp claws tore through the abdomen of the angel. From his abdomen, he took out a small, crystal-like object that had many dense angel characters on its surface. This was the angel core. From Arania's inherited memories, Roy knew that some angels had such things, but even in the inherited memories, there was no mention of what the cores were for. Therefore, Roy had only taken away the souls of the angels that he had killed earlier but did not touch the angel cores in their corpses. Do you know what this thing is for? Roy asked Vulgrim. Of course. Vulgrim rubbed his hands. I'm a rift demon. Thanks to my spatial ability, I know many secrets. Then explain to me. Roy started tossing the angel core in his hand. You probably don't know that. Some angels are artificially created. Vulgrim's eyes rose and fell with the movements of the angel core, but he explained incessantly, although angels are stronger than demons, correspondingly, their birth rate is very low. There are very few original angels that can truly be born from the eggs of angels. Therefore, in addition to forging weapons and armor, Heaven's Foundry has been dedicated to researching artificial angels so that Heaven no longer has the numerical disadvantage in the war with demons. Oh? Roy was stunned as he looked at the angel core in his hand. So, those with angel cores are all artificial angels? That's right. Vulgrim nodded. They first cultivate an angel embryo and then implant it with an angel core to carry a soul. Then they transform a collected noble soul into a holy soul under the effect of holy power and then place it into the angel core. And thus, an artificial angel with its own power and memories is born. This is a method of mass producing angels. If not for the low number of noble souls and the inability to create too many artificial angels, the war situation between demons and angels might be reversed. Roy was a little stunned. 
No wonder why I always felt that the equipment of angels looked much better. Seems like heaven is also developing scientific research capacity. Not only that, but it even has artificial angels. But this kind of technology should be more inclined toward the side of mysticism, right? After all, this angel core looks more like some kind of alchemical item. What's the use of this angel core? Is it used to make fallen angels? Roy asked. No, no. It's impossible for artificial angels to become fallen angels. Vulgram shook his head. Only original angels, which are naturally born, can be transformed into fallen angels. Souls contain the driving force of all things. Only a body without a soul is merely a puppet. Only with a body and a soul can consciousness and will be formed and become a true life. So, in fact, this angel core is only a vessel used to store and restrain a soul. After losing the soul, this vessel no longer has any use. The only value left is in research. Hmm, perhaps it can also be used as some kind of decent material for alchemy. Roy thought carefully and felt that Vulgram should not be lying, but he should also be hiding some things, such as the preciousness of this angel core. Roy grinned at Vulgram and laughed. Is that so? Since it's useless, I'll keep it for myself to play with. It should be good to make some accessories or something, right? Um. Vulgram was immediately awkward when he heard Roy's words. He did not expect that his efforts to belittle this angel core ended up with him choking on Roy's words. Yes, angel cores were not very useful, but that referred to the cores of low-level artificial angel soldiers. The angel core Roy obtained was from a four-winged dominion angel. It was not easy for an artificial angel to promote to the four-winged level. This meant that this four-winged angel might be from an early batch of artificial angels and had been alive for a long time without being expelled back to heaven due to death, which would have led to changing bodies. Like this, the research value of this angel core would naturally increase considerably, far from what an ordinary angel core could compare with. All right. Volgrim realized that he had walked into a pit and could only spread his hands. I admit that this angel core is very precious, so what price do I have to pay to obtain it? What do you have? Roy asked with anticipation. He knew very well that this demon profiteer in front of them had a lot of good things in his hands. With a spatial ability to travel freely, he could reach places that many demons could not reach and collect some relatively special things. Moreover, this fellow had no standpoint. He could trade with anyone, even the four horsemen of the apocalypse or angels. Roy had not thought about encountering this fellow before, but since he had encountered him, he could not let it go. Even without the soul and core of the four-winged angel, he planned to trade with Vulgrim ones. After all, Vulgrim still accepted souls as currency, and in the past transactions, he might have hoarded a great number of souls. However, Vulgrim did not mention using souls to trade with Roy at the beginning. Instead, he waved his hands gently and presented an item to Roy. You're in the midst of promoting now, and your body seems to be mutating. I think you may be able to use this. Roy looked down only to find that what Vulgram was displaying was. A canteen? Are you sure you didn't take out the wrong thing? Roy asked while staring at him. Of course it's right. This is something I stole from under the nose of the Angel of Death, Azriel. Vulgram said proudly. This is well water from the Well of Souls. Roy looked at him doubtfully. All right, let's just assume what you said is true. What is the use of this thing? Ha, this thing has many uses. Vulgrim waved his hands and gestured. But its greatest use is to purify and strengthen your soul. Chapter 146 Enchantment With Vulgrim's explanation, Roy finally understood what he meant. According to Vulgrim's description, this so-called well of souls was a place that heaven used to purify and condense souls. It mixed a large number of ordinary souls into the well water so that it could artificially produce noble souls. After all, it was too little and too slow to obtain noble souls from humans alone. From this point of view, the transmute function of the Haradric cube Roy created was not coincidental. High-quality high-class souls could indeed be synthesized, but the Haradric cube was simply a divine artifact to heaven in terms of efficiency. It completely skipped the long separation and fusion process and could directly produce the final product. Because the well of souls had such an effect, the function of the well water was very clear. In the process of continuously promoting, demons consumed a massive number of souls to obtain magic power so their souls would gradually be affected over time. This effect would be most obvious when promoting to high rank demon. It would cause the souls of high rank demons to become the evil souls corresponding to the holy souls. Take note, it was evil and not fallen. This type of soul was a level higher than a fallen soul, and this process was the sublimation of the soul. 
If he used the well water of the well of souls during his promotion to high rank demon, it would make his soul more solid and tenacious during the sublimation. The benefits were obvious. The stronger the soul, the more difficult it was for demons to be injured by spiritual magic. Even if a powerful enemy killed and expelled them, they would suffer less damage to their souls after returning through a gate of the abyss. Moreover, souls and bodies were complementary. The strength of the body would make the soul stronger, and the same was true vice versa, the stronger the soul, the stronger the body. At this moment, Roy's body was undergoing unknown changes due to the radiation. If he took the well water from the well of souls at this time, his body would mutate in a better direction. After hearing about the usefulness of the well water, Roy was very moved and bargained with Fulgrim. After he promised to help Roy strengthen Frostmourne in addition to the well water, the two demons successfully reached a deal. Of course, Roy was not a fool and would not easily believe another demon, so when he received the canteen of the well water, he specially placed it in the system space to check its attributes. Roy felt completely relieved when he found that what Vulgrim said was true, and the attributes displayed by the system indeed had the strength and the soul term. Although Roy could also create items that could affect souls through the system, since the effect was the same, Roy did not need to waste souls to create them. After checking the well water, Roy took out Frostmourne and handed it to Warglin. Holding Frostmourne, Vulgrim was slightly infatuated as he looked at it with pleasure. It had to be said that Frostmourne's appearance was indeed a masterpiece. Anyone who saw this sword would be involuntarily attracted to it. Although Vulgrim could not see the attributes of the sword, he could feel the power on it. Although he was not good at fighting, he was a bona fide master of enchantment and alchemy, so the first thing he said was, this is a sword of cursing full of dark power. After thinking about it, he said to Roy, initially, I wanted to add an angel slayer attribute to your weapon, but now I feel that this enhancement seems a little appropriate. Angel slayer? Roy asked in surprise. What enchantment is this? It's an enchantment similar to Dragon Slayer. Vulgrim explained. Among enchantments, there are often ones that specifically target certain creatures. Dragon Slayer is for dragons, Demon Slayer is aimed at demons, and Angel Slayer is naturally for angels. This enchantment would allow your weapon to deal greater damage to angels. It's a pretty good ability. Roy said in understanding. Isn't it good? It's best if this sort of cursing specializes in the power of cursing. Vulgrim said. In this case, as you continuously use it, the dark power attached to the sword will naturally condense and develop in the direction of the curses. Over time, the power on the sword will become stronger and stronger. It won't be good if the attributes are too complex. Then, how do you plan on strengthening it? Roy asked directly without thinking too much. How about heavy? With this enchantment, all enemies injured by this sword will become extremely heavy, causing their movements to become sluggish. Sure. Roy was not picky. In any case, getting Vulgrim to help him strengthen Frostmourne was basically a bonus from bargaining. Of course, it was worth it. If Roy were to create this heavy enchantment attribute himself, the consumption of souls would increase because of the increase in the attributes of the sword. Seeing that Roy did not object, Vulgrim took out his tools and began to fulfill his commitment. His tools emerged from the void, reminding Roy of Vulgrim's special ability, so he had some evil thoughts. This guy has probably stored all the good things he's collected in his space through his spatial ability. If I can break or find the space he hides things and directly snatch them from him, maybe I can make a fortune out of it. Of course, even if he wanted to, Roy did not really carry it out. The success rate was too low, and it was unnecessary. Even if it really worked, he would probably have to pay a lot. While Roy was lost in thought, Vulgrim gradually became flustered. When he began enchanting Frostmourne, he suddenly realized that he needed far more materials and magic power than he had imagined. There was nothing to be done about it. After all, Roy had created Frostmourne through the system, and there was an incremental effect when enhancing. Now that he handed it over to Vulgrim for strengthening, the incremental effect would not disappear. The heavy curse was only a relatively simple enchantment, but when it came to Roy's sword, the consumption of materials increased several times. This was akin to using a large number of materials to substitute for the use of souls. Not only was Vulgrim flustered, but his heart ached to death. He knew that he had been deceived by Roy's strange sort of cursing. The dark curse power originally attached to this sword was actually very condensed, leading to it having a natural repulsive effect on the newly added curse. To add it forcefully, he had to pay a greater price. However, Vulgrim could do nothing about it. It was a part of the deal. Although he was a profiteer, he would still find a way to carry it out since they had reached a deal. 
Thus, he could only endure the pain and continue to strengthen the sword. After he finally finished, Volgrim handed the sword to Roy and shouted, It's a loss. A huge loss. Damn it. I shouldn't have accepted your additional condition. Roy looked at the additional heavy attribute on the sword and felt very satisfied. This was equivalent to saving at least one or two thousand souls. How could he not be satisfied? So Roy threw the angel core and the middle class holy soul to Warglin. The deal is done. You can look for me if you need anything next time. Roy's greatest hunger was actually for Vulgrim's spatial ability. If he remembered correctly, Vulgrim had a type of spatial channel called a serpent hole. It seemed to be opened by him using his ability as a rift demon, and he could lend it to others to use. Using this serpent hole, anyone could ignore geographical factors and cross thousands of kilometers in the blink of an eye to reach another place. Roy did not know how many materials Vulgrim had consumed. But he seemed to be in great pain and said angrily, one loss making deal is enough. I don't want to do more. With that, his body suddenly disappeared, leaving that sentence as he left. Roy was not angry. He opened the canteen containing the well water and found that it was blue and full of an alluring smell. He plugged it again and planned to find a place to use the well water without disturbance. If nothing unexpected happened, when he used the well water, it would be time for him to break through to high rank demon. Chapter 147 Achieving High Rank Demon The condensed and concentrated magic power was continuously and quickly flowing and retracting through the magic power nodes in his body. Roy was now in a city park, but the originally beautiful scenery of this park was long gone. There was only a thick layer of black ashes on the ground, which was formed by carbonized plants that the wind had blown here. In addition to the black ashes, the original lake in the park was now only a big basin-like pit. Roy was now sitting at the bottom of this big pit. He was squatting on the ground, his long tail behind him, his pair of demon wings retracted behind him. His entire body remained motionless as he concentrated on compressing the last bit of magic power he had left. Every time he compressed magic power, Roy's demon heart would beat very fast. And this time, perhaps it was because of the terrain, the sound of his heart beating was louder than usual. Roy could hear the thumping sounds echoing in the entire pit at the bottom of the lake. His magic power stretched out and immediately shrank back. Every time he repeated this process, Roy could feel his magic power condensing a little. During this period of time, Roy had been constantly repeating this process, and his magic power had become more and more condensed. After about three hours, Roy's body suddenly moved. He spread his hand, took out the canteen of well water from the well of souls from the system space, and then raised his head to drink it. The sparkling blue liquid slid down his throat and Roy threw the canteen aside before completing his final magic power compression. After he completely compressed all his magic power, Roy's body began to change the next moment, as though some kind of signal had spread throughout his body. First was his demon heart. Roy could feel something seeming to grow on his heart. These things gave him the feeling that they were extremely tough threads that intertwined and interweaved with each other, completely surrounding and protecting his heart like a net. With the formation of this protection, Roy could clearly feel that his heart seemed to have become stronger and more powerful. The change in his heart was only the first step. The next changes were all around. Roy's muscles began expanding all over, his weight was rapidly increasing, and his bones made cracking sounds as he grew taller. These changes were very similar to when he promoted to middle rank demon. It seemed that the body of demons would more or less change every time they promoted. Roy spread his hands and found that his fingers had become a little longer, and his nails had become harder and longer. He grew taller, and his body grew bigger. Even the tail behind him had become much thicker, and some additional sharp spikes had grown near the end. These changes had happened in a short amount of time, so Roy's skin was now lacerated and bloody. At the same time, a strange feeling came from the shoulder blade on his back. It was extremely itchy, and two bumps bulged out on his back, as though something was about to break through his flesh. Roy gritted his teeth and endured it at first, but afterward, he could no longer bear it and could not help roaring loudly. With his roaring, a pair of demon wings covered in blood and mucus extended from Roy's back. Fuck. Why did a pair of wings grow out again? Roy ignored the pain and turned to look behind him in surprise. However, he soon realized that these newly born demon wings should be the wings that grew normally. They were the symbols of his frost demon bloodline promoting to high rank demon and his previous pair of demon wings were nothing more than his modification through the system. As the blood and mucus evaporated in the hot air, Roy's newly born demon wings became much drier and cleaner. Roy tried to flap them and found that the new wings were very powerful. Not only that, but after a while, 
Roy found that the air around the newly born pair of demon wings began to form a faint white cold door and become denser. And the original pair of demon wings began to emit black mist. The new ones were a pair of frost wings. And the original pair became dark wings. This change was something that Roy had not expected before. He currently had two elemental powers, one was the power of frost, and the other was the power of darkness. But in the magic power in his body, these two powers fused together. Unexpectedly, when he advanced to high rank demon, they appeared separately on the two pairs of demon wings. This way, Roy became a four winged demon. The changes were still not over. But this time, it was his demon horns. Roy could hear the sound of the demon horns growing on his forehead. His pair of demon horns seemed to have been pulled out by invisible hands, constantly growing and becoming thicker, turning into a huge U shape that rose into the sky. After growing again, Roy's demon horns had lengthened to more than 60 centimeters, and the color of the demon horns became pitch black. In short, huge, thick, black, hard. Similar to wings, the shape and size of demon horns were also symbols of the power of demons. The thicker and harder the demon horns were, the higher the rank of the demon, and the stronger they were. At the same time, the pressure that vaguely appeared during his promotion process earlier gushed out of Roy's body, seemingly substantial. The entire process of changes lasted for a long time, and this rapid growth definitely caused extremely intense pain. When it finally stopped, Roy's body was covered in dried blood and lumps of mucus. He was panting heavily, and his entire face had yet to recover from the distorted expression. He stretched out his claw, wiped his face, and grabbed a lot of small blood clumps. It was the blood that oozed out of his skin when the demon horns grew. After discovering this, Roy had to wipe a few more times, but he found that his vision was still a bit blurry. Roy picked up a stone on the ground and could see some strange light emitting from it. It was these light rays that made him feel that his vision was blurry. What's going on? Roy was a little stunned. He looked around and found that everything that appeared in his vision had such strange lights. What surprised Roy the most was that he could not only see these light rays, but he could even feel them. Moreover, this feeling was in all directions, even places that he could not see, such as behind him, under his feet, and so on. No way. Roy closed his eyes but found that he could still feel these objects and that the range was very vast. He could not help but say to himself in surprise, did I awaken the observation hockey? He hurriedly opened the system interface and checked his attributes. Roy found that the system attribute interface clearly showed that his rank had become high rank demon. His attributes, such as strength, speed, activity, and so on, had increased quite a bit. His appearance in the system had also become a four-winged demon, and finally, he found two new abilities in the skill column. Radiation Perception and Desolate Virus. Upon careful examination, Roy realized that these new abilities were probably due to the well water from the well of souls and the mutations in his body. Because the city had suffered a nuclear strike and Roy had been exposed to intense radiation, his body had mutated like the other surviving demons to adapt to this intense radiation environment. And at that time, Roy began his promotion, broke through, and drank well water from the Well of Souls. This well water with special powers not only strengthened his soul but also gave him special abilities during the mutation process. Radiation perception was a special sensing technique. All objects in the natural world would constantly transmit heat in the form of electromagnetic waves and particles as long as their temperature was above absolute zero. This transmission of energy was known as radiation. What Roy felt through this ability was the radiation emanating from objects. Through this radiation, Roy could clearly discern the size, temperature, and so on of the objects. Now that he had just obtained this ability, Roy was still not used to it, so everything he saw was relatively blurry. However, once he could control it accurately, it would become much better. With this ability, Roy would be able to detect and sense all things and objects within his perception range, and there would be nowhere to hide. The ability of the desolate virus was even more special. According to the system's explanation, it was because a portion of the magic power virus in Roy's body had mutated after being exposed to radiation. Originally, the magic power virus could only absorb magic power, but after this mutation, this portion of the virus actually had strong radiation energy. In other words, as long as Roy froze the ground, this frozen ground would also have a strong radiation effect. Being exposed to this strong radiation would cause fatal damage to living creatures. This was the meaning of desolate, the kind where nothing could grow. Of course, this strong radiation was not permanent. Once the radiation energy of the desolate virus and the frost ran out, the virus would die. After all, 
it could not survive too long after leaving Roy's body. After figuring out these situations, Roy rejoiced. In any case, the abilities brought about by these mutations had developed in a good direction. His current combat strength could be said to have reached a new level. Roy flapped his four wings and flew into the sky. Under the dark night sky, he flew excitedly and burst out his magic power freely. No matter where he flew, there would be two trails of white and black in the sky behind him, triggering a large-scale meteorological phenomenon, causing black snow and icicles to fall from the sky. The two elemental powers of frost and darkness were already material in his body. Although he had just promoted to high-rank demon, Roy was undoubtedly one of the stronger ones. After all, those with cheats were different. Chapter 148 Control After flying excitedly for a while, Roy finally landed on the ground. It was no wonder he was so excited. He was very clear that under the strict hierarchy system of the Abyss, only by becoming a high-ranked demon could he truly obtain freedom. Yes, becoming a high-ranked demon did not only mean strength but also freedom because only high-ranked demons could be regarded as having authority and truly become part of the ruling class of the demons. Just like in the human world, people wanted to become officials for that authority. Although there were the higher hierarchies of demon lord and demon king above high-ranked demon, it was rare to see these higher level demons. If not for the end war in the Darksiders world, it would have been absolutely impossible to gather so many demon lords, let alone a demon king. In other words, when Roy went to other worlds in the future, he might not encounter demon lords and demon kings. Without these higher level demons, no one could control and suppress him. Moreover, even demon lords did not necessarily use force to suppress high rank demons. Most of the time, High rank demons accompanied demon lords, and they were existences equivalent to housekeepers. They took care of trivial matters for the demon lords and served them, so the demon lords had to give them corresponding respect. Without a betrayal, even demon lords could not easily execute high rank demons. This was all mentioned in Arania's inherited memories. It could be said that after promoting to high rank demon, both his status and authority had improved considerably. Take Roy's execution mission for example. If he was not a middle rank demon but a high rank demon at the time, he could have even chosen to decline. And if he had chosen to decline, then demon lord Rogeros could not punish Roy for it. Therefore, Roy finally climbed to the upper level of the demon pyramid. Roy landed in a residential area of this city. Perhaps it was because of the density of the floors here, but the blast wave from the nuclear explosion did not completely raise this place to the ground. Many buildings still had some foundations and small structures left but the glass of these buildings was long gone. Roy could even imagine the spectacular scene the moment the explosion shattered the glass in this area. In this residential area, there were many low-level demons lurking in all corners, searching for human survivors and beasts such as cats and dogs in order to obtain blood and souls. For these low-level demons who luckily survived the nuclear explosion, this world was basically now their paradise. They could find scattered souls everywhere. In fact, when they encountered angels, they could even gang up and could kill them and they might even be able to obtain the souls of angels. When Roy landed, because he did not deliberately restrain his magic power, the low-level demons immediately felt the power and pressure exuding from him. They whimpered and spontaneously started gathering toward Roy. When they came in front of Roy, these low-level demons all knelt on the ground and bowed their heads. Those with tails extended their tails toward Roy. Those without tails spread their claws and stretched their palms up toward Roy. Roy had certainly seen this scene before. Back in the Heroes of Might and Magic world, the low-level demon Xeron Summon expressed their obedience to Xeron like this. This posture looked like that of an orangutan. From this point of view, Roy's choice to resist at that time was truly unconventional. These low-level demons were rather large in number. There were low-rank demons and middle-rank demons, adding up to about a thousand of them in total. It was fine for them to move and hunt for food freely before when there was no high-rank demon leading them, but now that Roy was here. They had to accept Roy's leadership unconditionally. This was the unique authority of high rank demons. From the moment Roy promoted to high rank demon, he had automatically obtained the authority of a commander, and he could command these low level demons at any time to lead them in large scale battles. Of course, Roy did not need to care about the low rank demons. But for the middle rank demons, if Roy wanted to lead them, he had to give them appropriate benefits. After all, middle rank demons should have their corresponding status. Roy squatted on a broken statue, looking at the low-level demons kneeling on the ground, and felt an unprecedented sense of accomplishment. He knew that as long as he gave the order, these low-level demons would fearlessly fight for him and plunder a lot of souls for him. 
Roy slowly looked around at these low-level demons. These low-rank demons did not dare to look up at him at all, and they firmly lowered their heads to the ground. They did not know the temper of this high-rank demon in front of them, so they did not dare to do anything that might anger him. The middle-rank demons were better and could secretly observe Roy. But when Roy looked over, they quickly lowered their heads, not daring to meet his eyes. Now, not only was Roy's four wings exuding powerful magic power, but his body was also much bigger. He was more than three meters tall and had well-developed muscles. Coupled with his even more savage appearance and demon horns, he looked extremely threatening. Therefore, all the low-level demons around were waiting silently, not daring to make a sound. Now, after a while, Roy finally spoke. This was the first time he spoke after promoting. He found that his voice had become much lower, and the scattered magic power mixed into the demon words greatly increased the sense of soul vibration. The moment he spoke, all the demons present could not help but listen carefully. Now, all winged demons, move out and fly to the sea to search for human weapons. Roy gave his first order. Find them. Roar. Yes. Your Excellency. With the simultaneous roar, the winged demons immediately flapped their wings and flew toward the sea. Roy also spread his wings and flew up, following behind them toward the sea. Earlier, Roy had seen traces of intercontinental missiles rising in the sky east of the city in the distance. Although they had been hundreds of kilometers away, the strong light of the flames was too eye-catching in the night sky, so Roy knew that there were definitely human ships or nuclear submarines. Nuclear bombs had been launched in the nearby sea. After all, this city was a large one with millions of people, and human troops had fought against angels and demons in the city before, so it was very likely that there was a military base here. The ships or nuclear submarines that launched the intercontinental missiles might have sailed out from a secret base in this city. It had been a few hours since the first wave of nuclear strikes. Although the angels and demons had suffered damage, the losses were not too serious, and many angels and demons were still active in the city. It was impossible for the humans not to observe this situation, so it was hard to guarantee that there would not be a second wave of nuclear strikes. The humans were already fighting with the mentality of perishing together. After the first wave of nuclear attacks, environmental damage was inevitable anyway, so it was very possible that they would launch more nuclear bombs in hopelessness and recklessness. The power of nuclear bombs was still very formidable. High-rank demons who were unprepared and did not have protection could die in the explosions. Of course, Roy did not want to be horribly blasted by a nuclear bomb as soon as he promoted to high-rank demon, so after commanding these demons, his first thought was to find those human ships or nuclear submarines. Although he now had the unique ability of radiation perception, it was impossible for him to search such a vast sea alone. With the help of so many low-level demons, searching would definitely be much easier. Numerous winged demons flew toward the sea. To Roy's surprise, it seemed that he was not the only one who thought of this. Other high-ranked demons had also thought of this. When flying to the beach, Roy saw a large number of demons gathering in other directions, and behind them were high-ranked demons commanding them. These demons that gathered divided their search areas tacitly, each taking action to find traces of humans on the sea. Some demons who knew how to swim dived into the sea and searched below. After flying forward about a hundred kilometers, Roy saw that even the angel army had appeared in the sky above the sea. It seemed that not only demons but angels also felt the threat of human nuclear weapons and did not hesitate to send troops to search. When the flying demons saw these angel soldiers, many of them looked at Roy, who was flying in the middle, waiting for his instructions. Roy looked ahead and found that there were several angels in this army that emitted rather strong radiation, indicating that they might be powerful, commanding high-level angels. Find the humans first. Don't get into conflicts with these angels for now. Roy ordered calmly. Thus, under his command, the demons tried to avoid the areas the angel troops were searching. It seemed that the angel troops on the other side had also discovered the existence of Roy, a powerful four-winged high-ranked demon. Out of caution, they did not rashly rush to the demon and only vigilantly watched him while continuing their search. Both sides maintained restraint tacitly and concentrated on searching for the human ships first, making Roy feel sorrow for the humans of this world. Not only had they encountered the end war, but they had also aroused the common fear of the angels and demons because they had fired nuclear bombs ruthlessly. How could this be described with merely the single word tragic? Chapter 149 Brief Interlude Flying Above the Sea Roy allowed the demons to search while he adapted to his radiation perception ability. This ability was very powerful, but the premise was that Roy had to master precise control of this perception. Any object, as long as it did not reach absolute zero, 
would emit heat radiation. This was the physical property given by the energy of an object and could never be eliminated. In other words, from now on, any invisibility effects would be useless in front of Roy. Even if the other party could control their aura and magic power to deceive the five senses, it was impossible for them not to emit radiation, and Roy's radiation perception would detect them. This ability was absolutely unique for finding people and objects. As long as Roy could proficiently discern the different radiation wavelengths of each object, even if he did not see it clearly, he could still determine the location of the object by the radiation wavelength it emitted. But for now, this ability was causing Roy a lot of trouble. Putting everything else aside, the sun and moon in the sky were massive sources of radiation. In Roy's perception, the sense of the existence of these two celestial bodies was incomparably intense. Without being able to control and block his perception of objects precisely, anything Roy saw now was affecting his perception. Fortunately, this ability completely belonged to him and could be controlled through constant practice, which was what Roy was currently doing. The search for the human ships by the angels and demons was still continuing, but Roy was now certain that the nuclear bombs the humans launched should be from nuclear submarines hidden under the water. If they were warships, they would have been long discovered under such an intensive search, so he gave the appropriate order to get the demons to search the seabed as much as possible. As if sensing the actions of the demon led by Roy, a high-ranked demon that had been flying nearby approached Roy. This should be a berserk demon, a demon race famous for its strength. He was about the same height as Roy, but his muscles were more developed, his skin was cyan, and hard scales covered some of his vital parts. Both his hands and feet had thick bones, and the claws of his hands were nearly a meter long, looking like the extra-long claws of the female experimental subject in the Wolverine but longer and sharper. Roy looked at this berserk demon's claws and could not help but think of his former modification plan. At that time, Roy had thought of transforming his claws into adamantium, but after his bloodline awakened, Roy found that he was more skilled at using magic power, so this modification plan was over. Looking at the black light shining from the berserk demon's claws, Roy felt that the hardness of this demon's claws was probably not worse than that of adamantium. After flying in front of Roy, the berserk demon stopped a distance away and then said to Roy in a low, muffled voice, My name is Gasrick. Powerful frost demon warrior, you seem to be stepping up your search of the seabed? Hearing the other party's name, Roy knew that this high-ranked demon did not have any hostility. This was an exchange between high-ranked demons, so he nodded. My name is Osiris. There should be human submarines near the sea area. Submarine? What is that? Gasrick was dumbfounded, but he quickly shook his head. Whatever they are, they're at the bottom of the sea, right? Roy nodded without saying anything. Gasrick looked around. Can you create a piece of land? I can think of a way to summon some sea demons to help us find them. Ordinary demons have no advantage in the sea. Sea demons? Roy was stunned before he nodded. Sure. Roy gathered his demon wings and landed on the surface of the sea. The moment he came into contact with the sea, the surface of the sea beneath his feet immediately froze, allowing Roy to step on it steadily. Roy placed his hand on the ice surface and output his magic power again. In the blink of an eye, the black ice beneath his feet spread out again. Just a small amount of magic power was enough to freeze the sea within a few kilometers. After becoming a high-ranked demon, Roy's magic power quality was incomparable. Even though his magic power value was still 5000, the completely compressed magic power was three to four times more efficient than before. To put it bluntly, if Roy fully unleashed his magic power, he could instantly freeze thousands of square kilometers of sea, and he could now use a skill like Ice Age. Is this enough? Roy asked. It's enough. Gasrick landed on the ice and firmly grabbed the ice with the sharp nails on his feet. He then shivered and said, Seriously, I envy you elemental demons sometimes. Roy did not say anything and merely gestured with his hand. He knew that races like the berserk demons were classified as war demons in the abyss, and their magic power was mostly used in combat. When it came to using magic power and elemental powers to transform the environment like Roy, they were far inferior to elemental demons. Gasrick did not waste any time. He began engraving the magic formation of the Gate of the Abyss on the ice Roy created. He planned to open a Gate of the Abyss here and summon some sea demons to assist in the search. His sharp nails could engrave marks on Roy's black ice, but Roy's black frost power contained the magic power virus and the desolate virus, so it did not take long before Gasrick looked up at Roy in astonishment. Damn it! Why is my loss of magic power so fast while I'm standing on this ice? Also, how can you have the strange, 
deadly power in the city on this ice. Roy did not explain to him and merely said, hurry up. This ice isn't real land, so it'll be troublesome if you stay too long. Gasra carefully stared at Roy for a while. As a high-ranked demon, he knew that Roy's power had to be unique, so he hurried to finish engraving the magic formation and input magic power into it. With the input of Gasric's magic power, a huge black gate of the abyss opened. Only after becoming a high-ranked demon was it possible to open such a huge gate of the abyss. This was determined by the nature of magic power. When Roy was a middle-ranked demon, he once opened a gate of the abyss through a magic formation, but at that time, only he could enter the gate of the abyss. However, a gate of the abyss opened using the magic power of high-ranked demons could accommodate many demons. This was why high-ranked demons could summon other demons to fight. When the opening of the gate of the abyss, a group of strange-looking demons emerged one after another. The reason why they looked strange was that they all had characteristics of fish creatures. Either the demons were huge and full of sharp teeth like a lanternfish, or they had a human body and a fish tail, rather resembling demons like Nagas. Just like what Kasrik said, these demons were all demons living in the sea. After appearing on the ice, these sea demons seemed to be very uncomfortable, but they still forced themselves to endure. They crawled on the ground and bowed to Gasric. Your Excellency, we are here at your summons. Please give us your instructions. Go to the bottom of the sea and search for human creations. If you find anything suspicious, report immediately. Gasric said coldly. Yes. These sea demons responded respectfully. But when they turned their heads and looked around, they were dumbfounded. Roy's ice surface covered a few kilometers of the sea, and they would have to go very far to jump into the sea. But the bodies of these sea demons were not very suitable for crawling on the ice. They would freeze. They could clearly sense the powerful frost magic power emanating from Roy, so they knew that the ice was created by this high rank frost demon in front of them. Thus, they eagerly looked at Roy, hoping that he would have mercy and put away his frost magic power so that they could enter the water as soon as possible. Looking at the ferocious sea demons staring at him with their small eyes and pretending to be pitiful, Roy was a little speechless. He could only lightly stomp on the ice, causing the ice beneath the sea demons to collapse. After entering the water, the sea demons heaved a sigh of relief and surfaced. Thank you, Your Excellency. Then they dived into the sea. After the sea demons left, Roy asked Gasric curiously, You can summon sea demons? Sea demons are the same as land demons and are divided into levels. Gasric explained. Low-level demons have to obey high-level demons. They rarely interact with land demons. But there are altars of the gates of the abyss and the ocean of the abyss, so you can also summon them. You only need to locate an altar at the bottom of the sea when opening a gate of the abyss. I see. Roy understood. Whenever he came into contact with some new demon races, Roy had an eye-opener. The more he interacted with them, the more he discovered how complex the demon race was. High-ranked demons might have conflicts with each other, but that would only occur when it came to benefits. Otherwise, high-ranked demons could communicate equally. While waiting for the sea demons to report back, Roy began to chat with Gasric. He found that Gasric had also gone to many worlds, and when they chatted, they were exchanging information about these worlds. When he heard that Roy had been to the Heroes of Might and Magic World, the expression on his face suddenly became strange. Osiris? I remember now. I say, could the enemy that Xeron is looking for be you? Huh? Roy narrowed his eyes. You know Xeron? He's looking for me? Don't misunderstand. Gastric waved his hand. I don't have much friendship with that guy. I only know him. When he was heavily injured and returned to the abyss, he hid for a while before appearing. Then he kept asking other high-ranked demons about your name and news. If you meet him, you have to be careful. Hey! Roy reached out to touch his demon horns. Who knows who should be careful? Chapter 150 The Destroyer Appears To be honest, Gastric's words gave Roy a reminder. Now that he had promoted to high-ranked demon, he was bound to go deeper into the abyss after returning. It was a world occupied by high-ranked demons, and with the fewer high-ranked demons, the chance of encountering Xeron would become quite high. Although Roy's current appearance was completely different from when he first met Xeron because of his promotions and modifications to himself, and even if he met him, Xeron might not necessarily be able to recognize him, the problem was that when demons distinguished people, Sometimes it was not entirely based on appearance but maybe also based on their magic power, aura, soul, and so on. In particular, the true name of a demon took root in their soul, and there might be some kind of magic that could trace the demon through their true name. 
Of course, Roy was now also a high-ranked demon. Even if he really fought Zeron, Roy would not be afraid. Moreover, Zeron was someone who played with fire magic, and Roy's frost power would be able to restrain him. In fact, Roy guessed that Zeron would have never thought that he would advance from low-ranked demon to high-ranked demon in such a short amount of time. If they really did meet, he would definitely be shocked. After they chatted for a bit, a sea demon suddenly came to the surface of the water and said to Gasric excitedly, Your Excellency, we've found traces of humans. Their ship that can sail under the water is about 15 kilometers away at the seabed. It's a big one. Upon hearing this, Gasric was energetic and immediately spread his wings and flew up. The sea demon led him on the sea while he flew toward the human nuclear submarine. Roy followed closely behind. Not only him, but all the demons nearby who heard the news also gathered. There was a lot of hubbub as a dense mass moved forward, looking like migrating birds. When Roy and the others were about to arrive, an enormous wave suddenly rose from the water as a huge object broke out of the water. With a loud bang, the tail of the thing emitted a giant flame. But there was not only one such item but three in total. The demons gathered around were shocked and could not help but give way. They were not too sure what these things were. Roy was the first to react, and he immediately shouted, Catch up and stop them. Those are human submarine launched missiles. The nuclear submarine at the bottom of the sea must have been surrounded by the sea demons. After realizing that it could not escape, it made the decision to perish together and recklessly launched all the remaining nuclear bombs. Hearing Roy's words, the high ranked demons reacted and immediately flapped their wings to catch up. These submarine launched missiles were currently in the initial acceleration phase, so the speed at which they rose was not too fast, and the high ranked demons soon caught up. Gasric was the fastest flyer. After catching up to a missile, he swung his claws. With a click, his sharp claws easily cut the steel shell of the missile into two. The bottom half continued to ascend a distance, while the top half fell because of the loss of thrust. A high ranked demon took a deep breath and spat out an enormous black fireball from his mouth, wanting to burn the top half down. Seeing this, Roy broke out in cold sweat. Without even thinking, he immediately waved his hand, and a black ice wall formed in midair to block the path of the fireball. After the fireball hit Roy's ice wall, it immediately exploded violently, and then the fireball and ice wall perished together. The top half of the missile continued to fall. Some flying demons reacted quickly and swiftly flew forward to catch this half of the missile. The high-ranked demon who spat out the fireball was taken back for a moment before looking at Roy. Why did you stop me? Damn it! Do you want to bury all of us here? Roy could not help but curse at him. That's the section that carries the bomb. The high temperature impact might cause the warhead to explode. Hearing this, the high-ranked demon broke out in cold sweat. He knew that he had made a mistake, so he stopped speaking. In fact, they had witnessed the horrors of the human weapons during the first nuclear attack. They were able to survive because they were not in the center of the explosion. But if they were not careful and accidentally detonated a nuclear bomb here, it would really be over. The flying demons flew over with half of the missile and respectfully awaited for Roy to handle it. Roy stepped forward and pressed his claws on the missile. With a clink, black ice immediately spread and froze all of it. Roy actually knew that high-tech weapons like this were usually equipped with safety devices, and they would rarely detonate due to collisions or high temperatures. But the problem was that he did not dare to bet that the safety devices would be effective against the flames of hellfire. Furthermore, there might be something like remote detonation. Therefore, he had to handle this warhead. With the temperature of his dark cold, it was enough to freeze the electronic components inside the missile, making it no longer work. Moreover, in his magic power, he now had the desolate virus that contained strong radiation, which could also interfere with the operation of the electronic components. The high-ranked demons pursuing the other two missiles returned with them. They noticed the situation here and realized that they could not casually handle the human weapons, so they brought them back and handed them to Roy to handle. After freezing the three missiles with magic power, Roy heaved a sigh of relief. The power of nuclear bombs was still very terrifying, and even high-ranked demons did not dare to be careless. Perhaps, if humans had been given more time, they could have really defeated both the demons and angels in this end war and won the choice of fate. Unfortunately, because of a scheme, the end war was started prematurely. After dealing with the three missiles, Roy got the low-level demons to find a deserted place to put them. A group of low-level demons obeyed his orders, while the high-ranked demons surrounded Roy. It seemed like they were curious about how Roy knew the characteristics of human weapons. Roy did not intend to explain further. 
He only asked Gasrick, the sea demon should have caught that submarine, right? Caught. Gasrick nodded. But that ship doesn't seem to have any resistance. The sea demons ripped the hull open, and as soon as the seawater poured in, the humans inside drowned. Don't rush to send them back yet. Let them search the seabed. There might be other submarines. Roy said. Roy was very clear that the humans of this world were probably already at their limits. Their homes were destroyed, and their race was facing extinction. At this time, humans could do anything. Regardless of his sympathy for them, his first and most important concern was to consider how to ensure his safety. He did not want to be hit by dozens of nuclear bombs while he was hunting souls. I am now a demon. Roy touched his demon horns and sighed. The rest was temporarily handed over to the sea demons. Roy and the other high-ranked demons planned to return, but just as they were about to leave, a sudden change happened. A fierce pressure that was strong enough to make even the high-ranked demons tremble suddenly came from the other end of the sea. All the high-ranked demons present, including Roy, felt it and could not help but look back. The low-level demons fared even worse. They were so shocked by the pressure that they fell into the sea one by one. Above the sea in the distance, they could see a huge black spot rapidly approaching. Damn! Damn it! This magic power aura! A high-ranked demon could not help but exclaim when he realized what was going on. It's a dragon! No, wait! It also mixed with the aura of a demon. Another high-ranked demon said. What the hell is it? Why is it so powerful? It's as powerful as His Majesty Samael, but I can guarantee that it's definitely not His Majesty coming. Roy was a little stunned. In his radiation perception, the black spot flying in the distance gave him the illusion of seeing another sun. The radiation emanating from the other party was simply dazzling. Quick, run! Roy shouted before charging toward the bottom of the sea. With his reminder, the other high-ranked demons quickly plunged into the water. Most of them were demons who were good at using flames, so it was very uncomfortable to enter the water. But how could they care about so much now? After entering the water, Roy and the others kept drilling to the bottom until they dived deep enough. They stopped and looked up at the water above. Then they saw a dark shadow covering the sky. Just for a moment, everyone could clearly see that it was indeed a vague shadow that resembled a dragon. This shadow flashed across the surface of the sea with unparalleled pressure. The moment the shadow flew past, the surface of the sea began to burn. Even at the bottom of the sea, Roy could see the flames on the sea. The owner of this shadow did not seem to be targeting them. So the high-ranked demons looked at each other in the water and hurriedly went to the surface to see what had flown over. The moment they surfaced, Roy and the other saw the departing figure on the burning sea. It was an immense, black dragon with a wingspan of nearly two kilometers. His wings were burning with raging flames, and every flap brought about a fierce heat wave. As he flew, he left a trail of flames on the surface of the sea. For a moment, Roy thought that he was looking at the black dragon in the world of Warcraft, Deathwing slash Neltharion, but then he quickly remembered. Right. This black dragon seems to be the final boss that war fought in Darksiders 1. It seems. It's called. The Destroyer?